This will be basically the outline for our morning. We'll talk a little bit about why we would even be interested in gardening for birds, butterflies, pollinators, and other critters. Then we'll talk a, about a little bit about some big philosophical gardening ideas about conventional gardening versus ecosystem gardening and kind of the perspective shift that comes along with that. We'll briefly look at some examples of what it might look like. And that's gonna be different depending on where you're coming from. We'll look at some universal key elements of habitat gardening, which include water, landscape structure, the combinations of trees, shrubs, lower plants, and then some plants themselves. And then after that, we'll move into some examples of design inspiration. And then finally, we'll finish up with looking at birds, bees, butterflies, and top plants for California gardens. And so by the time we get to that, uh, for those of you who are not coming from California, that last section is going to be very California centric. If you are just interested in a glimpse of what we see in California, especially in terms of the wildlife, and some of that might overlap with some of you in other areas, you are very welcome to join us for that. Uh, but just kind of a fair warning, that is going to be really focused on kind of more locally. And then we probably won't get through that whole, whole section. I can go on forever about that, but I will also, if we're kind of running short on time, just kind of show you what's in there because that really also can be a, a pretty good guide for you. Uh, even if we don't get through every single slide, if you want to download that PDF of the presentation. So to get started, just going to tell you a little bit about my morning today. When I do this class, I always like to spend a couple of minutes before it just wandering out into my garden with my camera because there's always something interesting and always something different going on in my yard because I do habitat gardening. I have a kind of small front yard and a large backyard. Front yard is all California native plants. Backyard is by square footage, mostly California native plants, but also quite a number of fruit trees and a decent amount of vegetable gardening space. And it's definitely not all or nothing. And why I'm gonna talk so much about native plants is not because native plants are the only plants that provide habitat, but on balance, they are going to be kind of the, the heavy hitters for providing habitat for our local birds, pollinators, butterflies, and other critters. And so here's just a little glimpse into my morning today on February 20th. So the first thing I become aware of walking out my back door from my kitchen into my backyard is that it is the time when mockingbirds are active and they are looking for mates. And so there was a couple of mockingbirds flying back and forth in the yard, power lines onto trees and back. One of them, a larger one who is here, uh, a male, is uh, has really, really been active lately. So he's the first one I heard. But this morning was the first time that I saw him flying around and kind of looks like they're fighting, but probably courting with a smaller female. So that is a uh, first thing I noticed. Always going to, he's usually on one section of the power lines, but that today he was uh, giving the female some space on the power lines and going to the highest point in our oak tree. And then as I was up there looking at the top with my camera, I heard a rustling down in the mulch, kind of maybe about 10 feet away from my feet and saw another very common inhabitant of my yard, California tohi, who focuses on kicking up the mulch and looking for seeds and little insects. So got a glimpse of him or her through there. They also commonly, we have a mated pair pretty much every year in our yard. And then heard a little bit of a chirping off to the side and caught a yellow rumped warbler who is a seasonal kind of more uh, winter season inhabitant in our yard and looked over there. They are very ornery and uh, you know kind of love to uh, quibble and squabble. So got a couple of pictures of this one in my dormant fig tree over in my fruit tree section of my yard. And then just a couple moments later, the uh, tohi flew over in that direction, got a little too close to the warbler and got to enjoy watching the warbler chase the tohi all throughout the oak tree. And then they separated and amicably went their own way. So always something going on in the yard. And as I'm paying attention to that, I hear a buzz fly by my head and see a hummingbird land in the uh, oak tree. So I was able to get 
nice close-up picture of that. Hummingbirds are amazing creatures. They're very territorial, very fierce with other hummingbirds and will sometimes be chasing much, much larger birds around as well. It's pretty hilarious. Uh, so we constantly have hummingbirds in our yard and with the angle of the sun, I couldn't get a good idea on this one. I'm not that great at hummingbird identification yet. They move so quickly. So I'm always kind of constantly learning, even though I'm teaching this workshop, I come to this more from plants and I'm just starting to learn more and more about the birds as I go. So you don't need to know everything at once. You probably won't retain all the information in this webinar and that's just fine. And then from there, I'm looking back into the oak tree. And if you have room for an oak tree in California, plant one. That's going to be the biggest powerhouse of habitat you can have, both for what the tree does and the structure. I mean, we will often have five or six species of birds, at least in the oak tree all at once. And on this kind of chilly morning, it really was uh, where most of the action was. So I was able to catch a glimpse of this fast moving sparrow, not sure what the species is on the sparrow. And that was over just a couple of minutes what, what kind of was happening in my yard this any kind of random morning. And I always am pretty confident when I'm teaching this topic that I'll, I'll find something going on. It will be sometimes different species, sometimes the same species depending on the time of year. But there's always something interesting going on in the yard. It's one of the things I love about habitat gardening, not only knowing that the yard is making that environmental contribution, but there's just always something amusing to see. So a couple of highlights just from last week uh, during the warmer parts of the day when the bird baths were being used more. And we'll talk more about bird baths later, but they don't need to be anything expensive or super fancy. But this is Western Bluebirds who showed up to our yard for the first time in the last few weeks. It was really exciting for my partner and I. Uh, we weren't sure if they were ever going to come along. They often grow or I mean, often live a little bit more coastal than us, but we've heard that they'll come around here. And so enjoying our bird bath. And then in another bird bath we have just on an old tree stump, we have yellow rumped warbler negotiating territory with lesser goldfinch. And then closer up to um, our bedroom, this is one that we can see from a slider that's in our bedroom. So, you know, reading or drinking coffee in bed on the weekend, in the morning, we get a glimpse of this bird bath. So we set it up there to make sure we can see that. And we have white crowned sparrow, who is a, a winter resident of our yard and then flies back up to the San Gabriel Mountains in the warmer weather, also sharing space with lesser goldfinch. So, had a couple of questions come in. I'll answer those really quickly. And then we'll kind of start really getting into the, the big heavy questions of why gardening for wildlife habitat. So quick questions that came in. First one was what kind of camera do I use? I'm picking it up right now. It's a mid range, not super expensive, uh, kind of mid range uh, Nikon single lens reflex digital camera. It's a D5300. I'm not a huge camera person. Uh, it's actually not my favorite camera that I've used. I do a lot of landscape photography and I'm, I'm not that thrilled with uh, how it takes pictures in, in real kind of blasting light, but I got kind of just their cheaper 70 to 300 millimeter lens, which uh, is really good for birds. I basically use this camera for the zoom lens now. And then I uh, have a different camera which is a Lumix for my landscape photography, which is also not their super high end one, but I just feel like it, it does better with colors uh, in full blasting sun in Southern California. So that's what kind of camera. Uh, I, I definitely very much feel like it's not about the camera. Uh, you do need a decent zoom lens, uh, but it's about kind of being out at the right time of day, more the right lighting. And then a lot of these pictures as well, uh, I think it's like a 12 megapixel, uh, maybe 16 camera. And then a lot of these are cropped and enlarged further, which still show up pretty well on the slides because it's not the most powerful zoom. Uh, and one of the things I like about doing this kind of photography is uh, I do a lot because I share these, but knowing that I want to go out into the yard in the morning and take pictures also gets me to kind of slow down and enjoy the moment uh, more as well as I'm focusing on different things. So it's some nice quiet time in the garden. 
Uh, question about what species of oak tree is that? That's a coast live oak tree or Quercus agrifolia. Uh, that's the most common dominant oak in Southern California. And so that's just a good way to go. Uh, they also grow pretty quickly. If you have room for one oak tree, they're evergreen. Uh, but wherever you are, look up the oak trees that would be likely to grow uh, in your local area. That one happened to be uh, there already as a, a nice, pretty fast growing young oak tree that had definitely been planted just by a squirrel or something in the yard when we moved in. Uh, do I post these photos on my social media? Not normally, although I am thinking about maybe trying to do more on our Waterwise Community Center social media. You should definitely follow it. There's plant, plant pictures that go on to there and uh, also like workshop announcements and things like that. Maybe we'll do some more. Uh, that is a hummingbird sitting on a red bud right here. Okay, uh, from Gypsy, is this closed caption? Uh, just got here. It is not closed caption. However, I'm gonna look into closed captioning on Zoom. It's the first time anyone's asked me that and I am not sure if there is a way for me to set that up. What I can tell you if the closed captioning will help you out is that we are recording this. It's going to be being posted to our YouTube channel, uh, which is at cbwc, cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And the last one that I, uh, last workshop that I uploaded, uh, I noticed for the first time that there was like an automatic closed captioning function on YouTube and it seemed to be working really well. And so uh, for someone who mentioned, uh, can you get a copy of this webinar? It'll be there on the YouTube. And then I will also type in slash presentations, cbwcd.org slash presentations. Sorry, it should have an S on the end. Will be where you can download a PDF with all the slides. Uh, okay, uh, and then last quick question since we were talking about oaks. Uh, where someone asked where they can find an Engelman oak seedling. Uh, I would check in with the California Botanic Garden in Claremont or the Theodore Payne Foundation in Sun Valley in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, if you're farther south, uh, Tree of Life Nursery in San Juan Capistrano might be a good place to check in as well. Uh, they're not the most common to find, but, but they're out there. Uh, and if it's not available right now, sometime in the year, it will be. And then last question before we move on from Penny. Why do native plants versus non-native plants provide better habitat for pollinators? That's a huge question. There's a lot of academic research going on right now uh, in between the two. And you'll hear some people saying only plant native plants. Uh, I'm not gonna draw that line because I garden with both native and non-native plants. For me personally, if I'm going to grow a non-native plant, uh, I am going to grow it for a specific reason. But that being said, you definitely see native pollinators on non-native plants. However, on balance, native plants local to your area will better support, in most cases, your native range of pollinators. There are some pollinators that are considered what's called generalists. They are not very picky. They will use a whole lot of different kinds of plants. But there are many pollinators which are specialists. They might only go for one plant or one genus of plants. They've co-evolved with specific plants over many, 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 many years. And so some of our native pollinators really do focus on or rely exclusively on some of our native plants. And so on balance, our native plants are going to be our, our powerhouses, which can often support generalist as well as specialist pollinators. Now, if you really wanna get into it, you can research specific pollinators, specific plants for those. That's gonna be much more specific than we're going to get into in this workshop. But my general recommendation, if you're focused on supporting wildlife in your yard is provide a wide variety of native plants that bloom in Southern California, I would say every month of the year, year round have something in bloom. 
depending on where you are, as close to that as possible, and you will see lots of life showing up in your garden. And so with that, you can keep your questions coming in, but we got to move on for now because we have lots to cover and really jump into it. For those of you who are just joining us, uh, I see some more people have logged in. The best way to ask questions and interact because we have a large group today is uh, I'm not gonna call on people whose hands are raised because there's a lot of downtime with the audio. Type those questions into the question and answer function. The Q&A button will launch that window as we go. And then I'm periodically going to be stopping between sections to answer those questions. Uh, questions I will be answering as we go along will be the ones kind of related to the topics we're talking about. I'm happy to stay at the end after 12 and answer kind of more personal specific questions as well. So why should we consider using the space in our yards to garden for wildlife habitat versus anything else that we might be considering? Well, one of my big answers for that and big motivations is that it's something that we can actually do. When we think about the environmental issues that we are collectively facing, and here I say we not only as humans, but often as kind of the whole biological community, uh, there are some big, huge issues that we cannot do anything about, or we feel like we cannot do anything about, or that we can contribute, but it, it feels like it's such a small, small piece of uh, any solution. And we're not going to save the world with any one of our individual yards, but habitat gardening is something we can do. And it truly is, if you build it, they will come. If you garden for wildlife habitat, you will see that wildlife show up in most cases, even in, even in very urban Southern California, you know, show up amazingly quickly. If you build it, they will come. And you can literally see the results right there. You will be providing for wildlife that need homes, they need food, they need resources. And like in this case with uh, monarchs that are being threatened significantly uh, by habitat loss. And you literally, if you want to in California can pretty easily turn your yard into among other things uh, without having to sacrifice any other thing that you want to do in your yard, uh, a monarch way station, just as one example. I really like this quote from author Douglas Talamay. He's written a number of books about home habitat gardening that are quite popular. And it's kind of for a nationwide audience. It's not specific for any region. So if you are joining us from outside of Southern California, I encourage you to check out his books. And he wrote, it's becoming increasingly clear that much of our wildlife will not be able to survive unless food, shelter, and nest sites can be found in suburban habitats and we can provide that in urban habitats as well and in rural habitats. Habitat is in decline, whether it's from a development, from uh, changed practices in agriculture, and we can help provide it. So this is narrow leaf milkweed, which milkweeds are the required larval food source for monarch butterflies. And this is a small patch in my backyard and most months out of the year, we have monarch butterflies, we have lots of caterpillars, chrysalises get to see that whole life cycle, and we are contributing that. And in doing that, it gets us in touch with the wider world. Uh, there's linkages, even without leaving your house, that you kind of interact more with other species, with wild species, uh, mostly in a suburban landscape. It's going to be birds, butterflies, pollinators, and lizards. And it's so interesting to see what happens then. So not only do you have this relationship and you are using the space in your yard to assist these species or provide homes and food for them, but it's also really interesting and educational. You'll start to be tuned in to the seasons where you live. So it's very different than a lawn where you're trying to do all of this work, use all this energy and resources to keep it like a static picture. Here, there's always gonna be something changing and that's part of what's appealing. So for example, in this winter season, uh, we have white crowned sparrows that come every cool season and then they come, they go up to the mountains. 
in the summer. And so the arrival every year in my garden of the white crowned sparrow is something that we kind of anticipate. And it's something we will look forward to as part of the changing of the seasons. Uh, that's just like one of many examples and every season is a little bit different. And so that's really interesting as well. And so whether it's for just you yourself, kids, grandkids, uh, it's really pretty incredible to have all of that going on in your yard. And it's something that you can go out and enjoy, but even more uh, just through, through your windows, you just get glimpses of it all throughout the day. And so some of the different features that we have set up, uh, I encourage you to like frame through your windows to make sure you get a glimpse of it. And all of that is therapeutic. Literally, it's been kind of studied uh, academically, the benefits of humans interacting with the wild world, interacting with the landscape, or even just seeing this from like a hospital window is literally will change healing rates, uh, just being able to see a scene of quote, nature. And so we can build that into our yards. And if you have cats, gives them something to look at. We have uh, four rescue cats at my house, but they stay inside because we are not going to let them outside where all of this great habitat is. Not the cat's fault. Cats are just built predators and they kill lots of birds. So they stay inside, but they enjoy looking out and seeing all the actions going on. And so all of this collectively creates a garden that you want to spend time in which makes garden care more enjoyable and almost magically a little bit easier versus pushing a lawnmower every weekend. And in Southern California, for example, most of the garden maintenance that happens is seasonal and happens in spring and fall. And those are the times of year where it's more beautiful and, and more comfortable to be out anyways, not that much to do in the middle of summer other than enjoy the butterflies and the pollinators and the birds that are hanging out. Most of the plants are going to be low water or adapted to the natural rainfall of where you are. So for these pictures that you'll see of my garden, vast majority of the garden is no more than water once per month, even in the middle of the summer and in the months it rains, we get a good soak. It's gonna be at least a month till we water again and pretty low maintenance. So this is uh, part of my front yard in the summer. So, we can do something good for the planet that makes your property a more beautiful and more enjoyable space. At the same time, it saves a ton of water and resources versus a conventional landscape. So that kind of seems like a no brainer. And so what I propose is not necessarily that you need to tear out all of your lawn or not grow vegetables or fruit trees. I love doing that as well. Uh, and have to only garden for habitat with native plants. But what I propose is that if we are not doing anything else specific with the space, maybe we can, should consider native habitat gardening to be the new default landscape for our regions with whatever kind of structure and plants are appropriate. And if we have something else to do, then we'll do that in that area. But if we build our landscapes to have these habitat gardens kind of as the default, we'll save a lot of resources, we'll bring a lot of beauty into our own lives. We will be supporting this wildlife. And the more individual landscapes that do that, it kind of has a cumulative power of all of these nodes of habitat gardening. And it creates basically uh, corridors that wildlife can use as they need to travel and migrate either locally or on much larger migrations. And the best part about it, like I said, is, is it's, it's not all or nothing. And especially a lot of people who are interested in this also want to grow some of their own food or fruit trees, and it can be mutually beneficial. So if you bring a lot of birds into your yard, sometimes you have to do some additional work to protect like young green vegetables from the birds. Mostly I just put uh, nursery flats like upside down over them when they're young or sometimes a milk crate, but you also get help with pest control. So many of the beneficial insects that are brought into the garden through habitat gardening, specifically uh, this category called parasitic wasps, which are 
not like wasps that sting us. They're tiny. Most of the time, they're hard to even see with the naked eye, but they are big predators of aphids and scale, which will cause problems on our fruit trees and our vegetables. And even some of the birds that we get like here in Southern California, like bush tits, love to fly into fruit trees and eat lots and lots of aphids off of the stems. And so you can have a cumulative effect where the more habitat you build, uh, sometimes birds will eat and you'll have to share the harvest, but they'll also help with the pest control. And you don't need to do it all at once as well. You can start a bit at a time, maybe just with one empty planter or one hedge that you wanna put in to cover up a block or a less than attractive old fence and then add more and more elements over time as you go. And so how doable is it really? It's totally doable. If you build it, they will show up. Uh, this is a little bit more than a year and a half ago now. I need to update the slide. But this, you'll see some other pictures from my backyard. All those bird pictures that you've seen are from my backyard. And this was a good chunk of our backyard when a little after we moved in, in December 2018. So has been a little more than two years since we started with almost nothing. But even just showing up and putting in that little bird bath that someone gave us just on top of a cinder block to elevate it some, and it's amazing, birds started showing up. And then the more we planted, the better things got. So thinking about the benefits of why we should think about wildlife gardening in our yards, if you start to look into like the science of landscape ecology, there'll be certain terms that you'll see that will come up, but here is the basic idea. This is, for example, the service area of the WaterWise Community Center. And then just outside of that, this is basically where I live right here in Pomona. So to the north, we have the San Gabriel Mountain Range. To the south, we have Chino Hills State Park and we have Prado Wetlands. Both of these, are major areas of habitat for wildlife. And in between, we have our neighborhoods. Not a lot of habitat left in these neighborhoods. And so in these neighborhoods, by providing nodes of habitat, then we start to build these stopover spaces for wildlife, whether they're traveling in between the two, whether they're traveling on longer journeys, so we've had great migrations of sister butterflies the last couple of springs. And even though it's kind of a north-south migration, as they come through these neighborhoods, they're actually traveling more east-west to avoid, I think, the tallest parts of the San Gabriel mountain range. How the butterflies know how to do that, I have no clue. Uh, but for example, our yards in these neighborhoods then provide stopover spaces for any of those species as they go. And in our communities, the more and more nodes that we provide, the richer the habitat gets. We have some birds that are happy to live here, for example, year round. They can survive in the suburbs. And when they get really great yards with great habitat, they will tend to move in and spend a lot of time there or visit it on a very regular basis. And then we have some that are going to be migratory. So for example, this is my yard right here. And when we do get that migration of the sister butterflies coming through, they will stop and linger and spend a lot of time in our yard. Uh, so much so that sometimes sitting where I am at right now, giving this uh, presentation from home, I could look out the window when I'm working and it's almost like looking at an aquarium with all the butterfly activity going on outside the window. And so here, for example, is our wild WaterWise Community Center demonstration garden where we have a lot of plantings as well. But as I drive from my house to work, uh, I don't see a lot of really habitat focused yards. And so the idea would be this just being one example is that every additional node that we get increases the connectivity between them and increases the value for wildlife and how well we can provide for them in the community. So if you are local to this area and you either have or end up installing a wildlife focused garden, please send me an email, let me know. You can reach me at design at cbwcd.org and I'll kind of start keeping track of them. And I'd, I'd love to have this map that shows over the years as I connect with people, as I network people with people in the area. I mean, I know that there's a lot more 
going on in residential yards in this whole area. But I would love to start kind of tracking and having this cumulative map that shows how, as a community, we are progressing and providing for that. So before we jump into that, this is what you should consider doing. Let's talk a little, a little bit about the philosophy that might guide us in terms of what we are doing in our yards. So traditionally, mostly what's happened is what I would categorize as conventional gardening in terms of how people approach their urban or suburban landscapes. In conventional gardening, either the only or the primary concern is just what it looks like. And habitat gardens can and should be very beautiful as well, but they go deeper than that. So in conventional gardening, the concern is, what does it look like? And the garden essentially is an outdoor decoration. Plants are ideally like sculptures and the, the apex or the goal of conventional gardening would almost be like to have a perfect magazine photo shoot garden that looks the same all year round, lawn always perfectly green, roses always in bloom, and we get a vision or maybe a design for the space and then the space is manipulated to keep it as close as possible to that vision for as long as it can and as th if things change every few years things might get ripped out and trying to like reset changes and disturbances in that landscape are most often a frustration and if anything deviates from that idea hard work goes in to eliminate it and get back to that original idea. And doing that is a lot of work. It's kind of stressful for the average home gardener. And usually it doesn't turn out that successful in the long run. And people end up looking at the pages from like glossy garden magazines and you never quite get there. And if you do want to get there, it's very expensive and probably takes a staff. Ecological gardening, which is what we're talking about today, in my opinion, is much more fun, provides much more value for the wider world, definitely for wildlife, and it's easier to be successful. Ecological gardening is gardening where every yard or garden is a living ecosystem. And within that, we understand that there are complex webs, webs of relationships between plants, between animals, even the microorganisms in the soil, the fungi, the bacteria, other little insects. And usually those microorganisms are helpful. Actually, very few of the bacteria and fungus in the soil actually cause problems for our plants. And oftentimes they are, the plants are most vulnerable when the ecosystem is, is disturbed. Oftentimes it's through the excessive chemicals and fertilizers that are used in that conventional gardening approach. And so with a more natural approach, we don't need to necessarily understand what's happening in all that complex web of life, but we acknowledge it and we kind of embrace that. We're primarily a steward of what's going on in our yards rather than that really controlling hand. We're in the mix, we're maybe planting something, we are maybe cutting something back, but rather than those just kind of controlling everything that's gonna happen, we see those more like interventions. And so we'll do something and we'll see how things respond and we'll observe and then we'll take it from there. And it's not like our garden is a done thing, take the picture, keep it like that, but it's always evolving. And with that, unexpected and delightful things happen pretty consistently after things get going. And often you end up with a more beautiful garden than you could ever plan. I really find this true, especially with California native plant gardening, which is mostly my experience uh, in terms of habitat gardening, especially if you mix in a little bit of wildflowers and then sometimes some of our other plants will seed and come up again somewhere else. And I feel like those gardens often end up more beautiful than could have been planned for, even by a really good garden designer. If there is a setback, if a plant dies or something, then it's not necessarily, I'm going to put the same plant back in the same place and use a bunch of chemicals and fertilizers and force that plant to grow there. It's more of, huh, was this the right plant for this place? Maybe there's something else I can try. Uh, maybe the microclimate has changed and it's shadier now and I should try to plant something else instead. And it's more of a, an exercise of just kind of reflecting rather than just getting frustrated and trying to force the exact same thing to happen. And all of this ends up with a much more beautiful 
and a much more magical almost space than a conventional garden that takes a lot more work and more resources, fertilizers, chemicals, all of that. And in the end, other than the environmental benefit, I really feel that this approach for most people is more fun, it's more interesting, and it's much easier to be successful in the long run, especially as our gardens evolve year after year. A conventional garden kind of usually looks its best at year two or three and declines from there. An ecological garden can grow and evolve, and an older one is often something that is, is just priceless. So wildlife gardening does all of this while, pro while intentionally providing food, cover, and water for wildlife. It helps to provide permanent homes as well as that connectivity and corridors for many species. And so just here's a couple of examples. This is a front yard garden, pretty small front yard garden that I have visited and photographed on the Theodore Payne Foundation's native plant garden tour that they have every spring for any of you in Southern California or even any parts of California. Theodore Payne Foundation is a nonprofit focused on native plant conservation significantly through urban gardening. They have a nursery and they do all sorts of educational programs. This year, because of the pandemic, their garden tour is all online. So for those of you who are a little bit farther out, makes it easier to join in. Lots of inspiration, uh, kind of modest projects, really fancy projects and everything in between. So it's cool to see different approaches. This is a front yard garden that was put in by the homeowner, first native garden that he did, designed it himself, did the work himself. And it's just a little patch of what I might call enhanced habitat, not completely naturalistic, but pretty naturalistic, not all local native plants, but a lot, and then other native plants. And through providing this matrix, not only does it provide habitat for a lot of wildlife, but this is on a side street that's pretty close to a pretty busy street. And so the whole experience for the homeowner of this yard and even from inside the house looking out into the yard changes versus a flat lawn where you're really experiencing much more traffic, even more noise from the traffic. This is just a little spot of relaxing, beautiful magic right there in a modest sized front yard. This is my backyard uh, at where I currently live at about a uh, little less than one year old. And then at, I think it was probably about uh, maybe year and a half, two years, here's the same yard kind of looking back from the other angle. And this is very late summer, early fall with weird lighting because of wildfires that were happening. Uh, really not considered to be the peak of beauty for most gardens, but especially in California, if you're doing this habitat garden where part of it is you're trying to focus on providing something in bloom year round, that also really provides beauty year round. So late summer into the fall, for example, that's when our California buckwheats really come in. And then even some of our plants that are a little bit more done for the year, like the Palmer's mallow, still have really beautiful, interesting form and contrast. Just to kind of quick you, quickly kind of run you through uh, pacing of this, this is my front yard, March 14th, after we planted. You don't need to plant things large. This was all one gallon or four inch plants put in in March. This is five months later. I had noticed uh, at that point in time, uh, I was in habit of sitting on my couch, eating a bowl of oatmeal every morning before work. And at five months after the garden was in, I noticed that out the window in the front, I saw this hummingbird, female hummingbird just moved in and would sit on this one dry blade of California fescue flower every morning in this exact same spot for at least two weeks. And she would sit there and then she'd either chase off other hummingbirds because there's a feeder in the front yard or also hummingbirds eat a lot of small insects, gnats or things like that. So I'd see her fly off, maybe grab something. Hummingbirds are incredible hunters. They are mostly successful when they fly off and try to get an insect and then fly back and land here to patrol her territory. And so it really does not necessarily take that long to have things to start to grow in. So this was, you know, if you build it, they will come. Here's my buddy hummingbird. 
And so this is again about five months. So this uh, you can see here is our Western redbud tree. So there's still a lot of growing to happen to really see the design of the landscape. But instead of just a lawn, you know, this is trash day in my front yard. So beautiful, bringing in a lot of wildlife. This is from the other direction, looking back in at about six months. And then no matter where you live, at least in the US, I don't know if they're an international organization, uh, you can get your yard certified as a wildlife habitat with the National Wildlife Federation if you provide food, water, cover, and places to raise young, which a lot of that is just having some like shrubbery uh, or trees, uh, uh, the physical structure of where nests can be built or animals can shelter. And basically it's just a self-reporting thing, but then with a small donation, you get this sign. So for example, my yard is definitely in my neighborhood, the first naturalistic native habitat garden to go in. And so we have the sign and anybody walking or through or the mailman, anyone coming anywhere near the door can see this and they kind of know what's going on, which is nice to kind of share with the community. So it's about six months. And something we'll talk about again later, but uh, it's really important is if you're doing wildlife gardening, a lot of us have been trained as soon as the flowers are gone, you cut everything back to encourage more flowering. So maybe important for roses, but if you're trying to develop seed for the birds, you need to let some of that stuff dry out and develop some, and then you can do a seasonal cut back later. So this is about 13 months seeing things grow in. And this front yard was mostly designed for birds, butterflies, and pollinators, although we do get lots of lizards. And so check quickly for questions, and then we will start to go through our key elements, starting with water. So Virginia asked, is that a large ceanothus in the background of the previous photo? I think that was probably the first garden photo I showed in Pasadena. Yeah, that is a large ceanothus. Uh, I don't know which one uh, in particular it was because the photo isn't that close, but it is, is a larger one. Uh, might be Ray Hartman would be a common larger one that would be planted down here. Uh, So from Grace, do you have any advice for saving money when starting a garden somewhat from scratch? Is growing from seed better? I don't have a greenhouse. Do I need to grow them indoors first? Uh, good question. For most of us, depending on where you are, but like just say, for example, for California, most of our California native perennial plants or woody plants are pretty difficult to grow from seed, not impossible but they, they take a long time to grow from seed. Some can be done from cuttings as well, but you need a pretty good setup usually, not necessarily a greenhouse, and it takes quite a while. So if you have the budget, things will be much better for most first-time gardeners to start from one-gallon plants or four-inch plants. Other than that, I would highly recommend you try to find a local botanical garden who might occasionally offer a class on native plant propagation or at least read up on it. And uh, you can kind of go from there, but you really wanna, you don't just wanna kind of start, you really wanna learn the, the basics. That yard that I showed in Pasadena, that guy had taken a plant propagation class from the Theodore Payne Foundation and a lot of the plants in his front yard, not all, but a number of them, he did propagate himself, uh, mostly from cuttings after he took that class. Uh, okay, have some other more specific questions, but I think I will hold those till the end. Uh, question about where do you buy native plants? Uh, we will talk about that in a different section later. And just a quick question that came in uh, that I'll answer now. What's the biggest pollinator? Birds, butterflies, bees, etc. cetera. Uh, different things pollinate different plants, but on balance, bees are going to be the top pollinators. Uh, hummingbirds do some specific plants, 
but less often. And at least in California, uh, butterflies do a little bit of pollination, but they are not like really powerhouse pollinators. Birds are going to be the, I mean, sorry, bees are going to be the main ones. So let's jump back into the presentation. Keep the questions coming in if you have them and we'll review them all the next time we move in. Uh, so key elements, and we'll start with water. Water is so crucial. All life needs it and a clean, reliable source of water can be hard to find in suburban and urban areas. So even something just like a bird bath is really, really a powerhouse in providing habitat. Like I mentioned before, we had put a single plant into the ground. We set up a bird bath in our backyard and it was amazing who showed up because it's not something, especially if you keep it clean, not something that's available all the time. It's also hilarious to watch birds bathe. So it's you know great entertainment as well. So this is a whole group of house finches, which are common visitors to our bird bath, enjoying a bath and a drink at the same time. And I just noticed today when I was putting this picture in, we also have a Western fence lizard hanging out as well, sunning itself on the rock. Uh, so we also have California tohi bouncing around in the same bird bath. And the bird baths don't need to be anything fancy. A number of the bird baths in my yard are just saucers like from a store that sells ceramic pots. And it's a saucer that would go underneath the pot. Uh, glazed is gonna be a little bit more expensive, but a lot easier to keep clean. We have to scrub pretty hard on these terracotta ones to keep them clean, but we just had them anyways. So we use them. So goldfinch taking a bath here. If you want to get into recirculating water features, a lot of birds really do like those, less for bathing usually and more for drinking out of. And so a lot of places that sell like fancy ceramic pots uh, will also sell a kit where the pot will sit on top of a buried into the ground kind of plastic, uh, what's called a vault. It's basically where the reservoir of water can go and the pump goes in and you can usually, they have a screen on top and you can put rocks or gravel. And then with the inexpensive pump, have it just kind of overflowing on the sides. You have to be careful to balance it, which can take some work but that can give you just a little skim of water over the edge continuously, keep things cycling and certain birds really like that. And it doesn't take a ton of water because it's not a huge surface. And so here's an example. This is my parents' backyard garden in Van Nuys, California and Falcon coming down and enjoying checking out what's going on and a drink. Some tips for water features, all non-recirculating water for drinking or bathing, like for example, for bird baths, for animals needs to be kept clean. That's crucial. Birds have no decency and they will poop in the same water that they drink and that will encourage nutrients, bacteria, all that sort of stuff. And so if you're gonna provide it, you wanna make sure you're providing clean, healthy water. So one huge tip is make it easy for yourself by making sure you locate your features where they're close enough to a hose that they can easily, you can get fresh water and you can clean things out or you can top things off. It's best to change out bird bath water daily and at least every other day. Uh, also kind of depends on the time of year and summer in our yard, we really do need to clean things out daily. Uh, in the winter, we normally do daily as well, but occasionally if it's not a lot of evidence that it's been used and the water looks really clean every other day. And mosquitoes, a lot of people are worried about mosquitoes with bird baths and it's something you should think about. Uh, mosquitoes take 72 hours for their egg to go from larva to go to flying mosquito to where it could cause a problem. So if you're cleaning out your bird bath water every day, and that doesn't mean you need to scrub every day, but you know, just basically tilt out the water, put new water in, uh, just that action of tilting them out will basically smash any larva if there are any, and you won't ever have habitat for breeding mosquitoes. You're going to want to scrub them out relatively regularly, depends on the use and the texture, but generally once a week to once every couple of weeks, depending on the time of year and the texture, uh, to scrub them out. And that will help get rid of algae and give it a deeper clean. Don't use chemicals. 
Uh, sometimes we'll use a little bit of rubbing alcohol in a spray bottle and then let that sit for a few moments and then give it a good thorough rinse. And then I just saw uh, Diane has some bird baths as well. And she texted in or into the chat, you can check that out, that she uses a wire brush and uses baking powder. But yeah, you never want to use bleach or ammonia. So saucers are great. Uh, in general, if you're going to use a saucer for a bird bath, it's best not to have them directly on the ground, maybe elevate it somehow. Uh, big log or tree stump, tree stump is great. Uh, birds are going to be safer and generally more comfortable a bit higher up uh, if there's stray cats in your neighborhood that they're kind of easy picking sometimes if they're on the ground. Now, that being said, different birds have different preferences. So we don't have a ton of stray cats in my neighborhood. And recently, uh, my partner and I have put a couple of bird baths out on the ground because we've noticed that a couple of our birds, which dwell on the ground mostly anyways, uh, specifically the California tohi, which kicks up the mulch and eats seeds off the ground, really appreciate uh, bathing close to the ground as well. A variety of sizes and depths is ideal if you have the space for it and want to maintain more than one. Uh, some of the smaller birds like smaller bird baths, some of the larger birds like a larger bird bath. So a uh, large bird bath that you saw the bluebirds in is one that we will see uh, hawks come in and take a drink and a bathe on a hot day in our yard as well, but we never see them trying to crowd themselves into the smaller one. Uh, so yeah, different sizes and depths works really great if you really want to try to do it as much as you can. And then also for pollinators, specifically birds and butterflies, uh, also having a saucer or two where you have water, but you also have some stones or and or maybe some gravel or a little bit of sand is ideal because insects, if they try to get water from just a saucer or a bird bath filled with water can sometimes get kind of swept into that water and they can't crawl out. And so if there's sand and gravel where they can easily land on it and then they can crawl to the edge comfortably and then drink, that's going to be very effective for providing for them. So here's just an example of a perfect little setup elevated on a big log and you can see the glazed saucer and just one rock in there for sometimes other little birds like that rock to perch on. Here's one to elevate it that I had. If, if you don't have access to a big log or a tree stump that I had in my backyard at uh, the previous place that I lived. And this was something that we, I just bolted this four by four, scrap piece of four by four into uh, at the most big box hardware stores or lumber yards, you can get what's called a precast concrete pier, like for decking, where it's a, it's a little kind of pyramid of uh, concrete with some straps that you can then bolt the four by four into. So that provided some weight. Although I will say, I would recommend if you're going to do something like this, don't just have this one little piece coming off, have a really better, uh, wider area on top of it for the dish to sit. This was great for the birds, but then when somehow one day a squirrel jumped onto it, uh, this fell off and it uh, shattered the bird bath. And in terms of sighting them, they are going to be best in general for birds if they're close to a small tree or a dense shrub that gives the birds both somewhere to flee to. And also they'll, we see them like they'll fly into a nearby shrub, kind of check things out, make sure that it's safe and then go to the bird bath. And then if they get spooked, they can go right back into shelter. Try not to put it in a place where cats can easily hide and pick them off. It's estimated that two to 4 million birds are killed by cats daily in the US. So if you're really trying to have a yard that supports wildlife habitat, uh, having your cat be an indoor cat, or if you do want your cat to go outside, actually considering having the cat on a harness and a leash to kind of walk around with you to check things out is the best practice and the best way to go. And it's a little bit uh, weird to have your cat get used to being out on a leash at the beginning, but at a previous place we lived, we had one cat that really liked to go outside on his leash and it worked out 
well for everyone involved, and we never lost a bird. In addition to bird baths, if you have the space and the ability to set it up, it's ideal to provide a source of moving, recirculating water. And this can be with a simple pump submerged in a container, or it could be like we saw overflowing into that pre-made kind of vault. In these larger water features with more uh, water that's not kind of tipped out every day, running water or moving water is the best thing to do to help prevent mosquitoes, but depending on the setup, it might not be enough. So a couple of options that you have is if it is a large enough container and it's not something that's overflowing, you can use mosquito fish. Mosquito fish are often available for free from a local vector control district, uh, both in Los Angeles and San Bernardino County. They make them available for free. You can call them up and ask them how to get a hold of them. And you can also use a product called Dunks, which is a natural bacterial produced uh, chemical called BT that's in this little kind of tablet form. And you just put one of those tablets in usually about once a month. And that interrupts part of the life cycle of the mosquito larva so that they can't ever become mature. So this is the larger water feature with recirculating water that we have in our yard. It's a galvanized water trough, like for a horse. This is just one that we kind of found in the backyard of a place that we used to rent and it was half filled with dirt. Someone tried to grow vegetables in it, but didn't drill any holes for drainage. So we emptied it out. We filled it with water. We put some milk crates in it to then elevate some pots for a few native aquatic plants that we wouldn't have anywhere else to grow. And it's just a simple $35 fountain pump attached to a sprinkler riser. And that just goes to an outdoor extension cord that's buried in the mulch. We know where it is, so we're not gonna stick a shovel through it by accident. And then we did have, even with the recirculating water, uh, a mosquito issue in that. And so our local vector control district, where we were living at the time in Los Angeles, came, took a look, and dropped off a bag of mosquito fish. We put them in there, and we have not had any mosquito problems ever since then, haven't ever seen a mosquito larva in there. They're voracious. If you have some plants in there where there's some algae, occasionally an insect will kind of come on the surface. Uh, we don't feed the mosquito fish, never have, and they just sort of balance their population to the amount of water in there, and it all works out great. And one morning, we were like, where are all the songbirds today? And then noticed everything had gotten quiet because we had a Cooper's hawk that came down and was checking things out perched here. And we've seen hawks a number of times bathing in this larger feature. As well, we get lots of morning doves in our yard. They love to eat all the various seeds on the ground and they like to use the larger water feature as well. I see, I don't have time. There's lots of stuff going on in the chat. So I don't have time to really read through all of it as we go because we have a lot to cover, but I would recommend uh, you know, plenty of people at the end of the workshop, if you wanna go back through the chat, you might check that out. Uh, if you have questions because the chat is so active, which is awesome, please type them into the Q&A. Uh, it's gonna be harder for me to keep an eye on the chat because it is so active. But I did just saw, uh, why, why do I have the pump? Uh, yeah, the pump is just to circulate the water. The water stays fresher, there's less algae and there is less uh, insect issues by having that recirculating water. It also, for the fish, because there's fish in there, uh, that recirculation helps oxygenate the water to make sure that uh, there's plenty of oxygen in that water for the fish. And so you can see here, this is where it is set up in our original yard where we had it, and the electrical cord just comes out the back and over to an outdoor outlet. Here is a mini version just set up in a pot, doesn't overflow, but just a little pump that keeps things just circulating a little bit. And uh, actually saw and picked up one for our demonstration garden, works pretty well. Uh, Home Depot these days, it was like 25 or 30 bucks, sells a little kit meant to adapt a small pot like this, where over the cord, there's actually a little plug that can kind of slide into the, the hole. And so you can set it up to where that plug uh, clogs up the hole that comes in the pot and then the cord goes out underneath. It's a pretty 
easy, quick little setup. So that's water. It's not rocket science, but it's super important. Another key element is the physical structure of the landscape itself. Basically overlapping tiers of vegetation of various densities. So we're talking trees and shrubs and ground covers, both flowering perennials and often some grasses as well. Many moth species, as well as some butterfly species like skippers actually use grasses as their larval host plant. And one of the things that's really important to remember is that we want lots of ca caterpillars in our gardens. Often traditional gardeners have considered caterpillars a pest insect and would even spray insecticides on them because they're eating the foliage of my plants. In an ecosystem or a natural or a habitat garden, you want to encourage caterpillars by providing their host plants. They turn into butterflies and moths, which are good to have around, but also caterpillars are crucial, crucial food sources for baby birds. Uh, even in most birds where the adults will eat seeds, there's only a few species of birds local to Southern California where the, the young birds will mostly eat seeds as well. The vast majority of young birds need that higher protein of an insect diet and caterpillars are just packed with protein. They're essential to raising healthy young birds. And the nice thing about that balance formed in the ecosystem of a natural garden or a habitat focused garden is that even if you're providing those larval food plants for the caterpillars, you will very, very rarely, I've never had it happen to me, have so much eaten back off of those plants that those plants are you know, looking bad. Normally you don't really even notice them. And the fact that a lot of them are getting eaten by, by birds kind of helps balance everything out. You get the butterflies, there are many more caterpillars, you have the bird food, it's that whole system kind of working. And so even if you have a small yard, you can have overlapping tiers of vegetation that provide both the different species diversity, as well as the physical structure for birds to be nesting in, uh, birds to be sheltering in, all of that sort of stuff. And so here's just one example of my backyard. This is actually tied in with my water harvesting system. And we have a little sunken area that's a western meadow sedge area that's the final area where water that goes through our dry stream bed even coming around from the front of the yard is allowed to kind of flood and soak in creates a little mi moisture microclimate as well for quite a while after the rain and so we have this meadow with the sedge grass-like plant uh, yarrow flowering perennials and then we've created this terraced area which has a western redbud large shrub that will be pruning up as a tree very young over here a palo verde tree these are a little too close together, but we wanted both species. So we'll have to do some creative pruning over time, which is just fine. And then we have some shrubs, large perennials and some annual wildflowers, really kind of providing everything in this corner of the yard. And this is this corner of the yard would be the equivalent of a, a typical smaller backyard. And there's a broken concrete patio right there. There's some backyards that are smaller, but you really can kind of have all the structure, many different types of plants, woody plants, perennials, and annuals, as well as a little meadow, all in a pretty small area if you want to. If you're more interested in how the water harvesting part works that leads to this flood and meadow, on our YouTube channel, we have a recording of a workshop about rainwater harvesting for home landscapes, and we use the water harvesting on this property as a case study example, the planning and the construction of it. So you can see much more about that if you take a look at that rainwater harvesting for home landscapes. And so here's just also looking at the front, uh, different layers. So Toyon, which will be our small tree in the front, growing in, still young. You can see our hummingbird feeder right here. Uh, spider webs, I mentioned, my partner made a couple of really nice wreaths out of native grape vines as she was cutting them back at a property that she worked at a couple of years ago. And spiders love to live in there and make little spider webs. And then we'll actually sometimes see hummingbirds harvesting those spider webs because hummingbirds actually use spider webs as one of the main components to 
weave their nest together. And so their nests become flexible. So they're tiny when they're just eggs. And then the nests actually expand as the birds grow. And so having all of that together, kind of that whole system really increases the habitat. And then along the edge, we have a combination of some grasses as well as some of our favorite perennials. Uh, working with perennials along the edge of a landscape next to the walking path works well because their sizes are very predictable. Then moving a little bit farther in to larger shrubs where if they grow a little bit wider, there's room to accommodate that. And then trees a little bit farther in is a general nice way to go. Vines, if you have room for some big rambling vines, are really good for providing shelter as well. So here's a hybrid. It's a hybrid between, naturally occurring hybrid between a European wine grape and California native grape called Rogers Red that turns a bright red in the fall. And our California tohi loves to hang out in there and then we'll see it running out along the wall and then down into the garden. In terms of the structure as well, places to perch. So bushes and trees are really important places as well, but some places to perch where there's not a lot of foliage around is also appreciated by a number of bird species, especially the ones when they're hunting insects. So in nature, snags, standing dead trees or dead bushes will often provide this. But most of the time in our suburban or urban yards, we're not leaving a lot of dead trees or dead bushes. We would take it out and plant something else. So oftentimes that's gonna be a non-living place to perch. So this is actually just a, uh, I had to dig up a fence pole. And so this is the very heavy concrete footing that was buried in the ground. And when I got that out, I realized I could just kind of tip it over in the garden upside down as kind of a sculptural element that then birds like to perch on as they're deciding where they wanna to go to eat some seeds or to try to catch an insect. Tohi's mostly a seed eater. Uh, and then we also have a couple of areas where we've taken branches of decent size and then just dug like a couple of foot hole in the ground, set, set them in the ground and kind of stabilize them. They won't last forever, but for example, uh, Black Phoebe, this is taken from where I'm sitting right now, out the window of my, into my front yard. We have this right in front of it. And I'll see, for example, Black Phoebe, who is really an aerial acrobat that eats a lot of insects, land here. And that's a great spot for it to look through the yard for the insects it wants to try to go catch. And as you can see here, went and caught something and then coming back to eat its snack and then go try to catch something else. And then having some amount of woody debris is really important to build that whole system. So some wood chip mulch is good as well, but having some branches or logs really, really helps build habitat. Now you need to be wildfire smart though. So I live in a kind of locked in suburban area, well away from the urban wildland interface. So I feel perfectly comfortable doing this. If I lived up against the mountains, this is not something that would be wise. So you need to know what's going to work for you. If I lived up against the mountains though, there's not far away, there's gonna be plenty of natural material that uh, the wildlife can use for this purpose, but in the middle of the suburbs, not so much. So here I have a small wood pile of tree prunings that is not for firewood, but it's just for habitat. So many of you may have seen, they've become more and more popular these days, whether they're big custom fancy ones or things that people buy online, uh, insect hotels or pollinator hotels, those can work, but this will do all of that and more. And the price is right. And there's much less maintenance because it gives a lot more uh, material for things to go back to year after year. Those pollinator hotels are kind of cool to see because you can literally like see who's used them, but this will do all of that function in a much easier way and provide space for many, many different insect species. And with the insect species, then we see lots of lizards coming in and out of here to get snacks on beetles or other grubs uh, and birds coming in and out as well, as well as some of the pollinators that will actually make their nests in wood cavities in there. Uh, often people will ask, what about termites? I can't promise you that there's not a single termite in here. What I can say is I've been doing this for quite a while wherever I live, and I've never seen it cause a termite problem in the times of year 
like locally for us in the fall is when termites are going to be most active leaving their galleries of where they live and i've not noticed termites here could be that if there are any the birds eat them right away as soon as they are leaving so if you're very worried about that then by all means skip this part or you might just have a little bit of stuff here and there so we have one main pile and then we have other logs and various things throughout the garden which can be a little seat and also have that habitat value. And then also a log like this, birds will also perch on as well. We happen to have many uh, that were just seedling, uh, very hazardous trees when we moved into this place. Unfortunately, we had to take them down, made room for us to plant this great habitat garden, but it did provide us with lots of woody material for these purposes. And so they can also just be kind of artistically kind of put here and there throughout the landscape and will do their job. Diverse coverings of the ground really make lots of little niches or kind of micro habitats for all sorts of different life and that whole system. So that might be a combination of wood chips, gravels and stones, and then remember to leave a bit of bare soil because some of our pollinators, specifically our native bees, are solitary ground nesters and they need bare soil for the galleries that they will inhabit for their nest. If it's wall-to-wall -wall mulch, which some of us have been trained to do as gardeners, uh, that's not going to give them the space that they need. So a little bit of bare soil here and there is useful. And I like to kind of combine all of those things just into the mulch layer. So here's a pathway. This is a small buckwheat plant near it, a great fall bloomer, late summer bloomer for lots of little insects, and then just mixing in little gravel pieces of bark. Most of this gravel, all of this gravel in this picture are just, uh, we have kind of rocky soil in parts of our yard. So overall a pretty nice loam, but there's a decent amount of rock. We just put it to the side, fill buckets as we find it, and then just use it kind of here and there throughout the landscape. If you have the ability to, with your woody mulch, the best mulch that I recommend is just ground arborist trimmings, various species of wood, as long as the trees aren't like, uh, you know, trees that are dying from some sort of fungal infection. Uh, you can often get it for free if you're willing to take enough of it. And then different sizes is great. Some bigger pieces, some smaller pieces uh, provides those, again, those different habitat niches. Patch or two of bare soil. So this is an example, a native bee nest. And if you're gonna have something like a dry stream bed that provides a moisture microclimate, drier microclimates, and then the various combinations of stone and mulch. Together, this all provides diverse food sources, shelter niches and nesting material for birds and insects, which are then food for other birds, lizards and other insects. And as a bonus, like I mentioned before, all of this is gonna help with pest control on your more conventional or maybe your edible plants. And so now we're going to shift to be talking a little bit more about plants, but I'm noticing that it's just about 1030. We're about halfway through our workshop. So I think now would be the time to take a quick break. So now we're, we've talked some about structure. Now we're going to talk about the plants that create that structure. Plants can be selected to provide seeds, fruit, leaves, or flowers with nectar and pollen. And those are going to support a diversity of birds, native bees, butterflies, and other interesting creatures. And the best plants for this are usually going to be native plants to your area. And they can then be easily selected to be perfectly adapted to whatever kind of soil you have, the site you have. And in most cases, then that's gonna require no fertilizer, no pesticides, and little irrigation water. So towards the End of the presentation, we have a top plants discussion for Southern California that will apply to much of California, but there are lots of good places to research wherever you are. Oftentimes there's going to be a native plant society, a botanical garden that will help you provide or have a database for wherever you are. So for planning this nature sanctuary for plants, the mantra is going to be focus on putting the right plant into the right place. This is the number one tip for being successful with growing plants and maintaining plants. 
You want to research the needs of the plants you're thinking about and make sure you're putting the right plant into the right place with the amount of sun, full sun, part sun, shade. Full sun doesn't need to be full blasting all day. Usually with growing plants, it's defined by six or more hours of direct sunlight throughout the majority of the year. Water needs, you're gonna to wanna to group plants with like water needs if you're doing supplemental irrigation. Water-wise plants or native plants being overwatered in Southern California is one of the main issues that people have. So group those plants with the similar water needs so you will be successful. The size, make sure you look up the mature size the plant is going to be and realize that for a lot of plants, like shrubs especially, uh, trees often take longer to get to their full size, but perennials and shrubs, a year or two, sometimes they'll be the full size. So if something's going to be eight feet wide, in a couple of years, assume that it's going to be eight feet wide and don't pack in too many plants uh, too close together and just assume that it's going to work out in the long run. Usually when that happens at six months, everything looks great. And then around the time when the plants really need their space, everything starts to get overgrown. There's not as much air circulation. There starts to be sometimes disease issues because of that lack of air circulation. And it's almost impossible to do all of the pruning. It makes it a lot more work. So plant respecting the full eventual size of those plants. And then if you need to maybe sprinkle in a little bit of annual wildflower seed uh, in between, but not too close to the, the new plants to where they're going to be kind of overrun with the wildflowers that can cause issues as well. And then your soil drainage. Basically, do you have fast draining soil or do you have heavy clay soil that drains slowly? If you have fast draining soil or well draining soil in California, that's kind of ideal because a lot of our water wise plants or our native plants want well drained soil. If you have slow draining or clay soil, that's just fine. There's tons and tons of great habitat plants that are perfectly adapted to clay soil. You're just going to want to make sure that you pull from lists of plants that are adapted to that soil type. You're not going to be able to add so much sand that you're going to change your soil type away from clay to a loam. Usually when that happens, people just make concrete, just accept your soil type and go from there. If you have heavy clay soil, uh, mulching with a wood chip or an organic mulch over time can, as it breaks down, worms will mix it in. It can slowly increase your drainage, but you're still always going to have clay soil and that's just fine. If you are going to start by choosing just one small area to work with, a sunny area will generally be the most effective. If a shady area is what you have, that's fine. But in general, we're gonna have plants that are gonna be blooming for more of the year and our pollinators will be most active in a sunny area. For maximum impact, aim to have a diversity of species in bloom and in fruit for as much of the year as possible, but also keep it maintainable. If you're someone who you're a gar gardener is like how you identify, that's your hobby, you're really into learning about and seeing how each plant grows, then have a huge diversity of different plants. But a lot of people who I work with, they want a nice looking yard, they want it to be low water, they want it to be environmentally friendly, and you know, they, they'd be very happy for it to be something that supports birds and pollinators, but they don't want to be out there spending a lot of time in their garden. They just want something that's going to do more for them than their lawn used to. If that is you, that's great, but don't put in too many different types of plants. In general, if that's you, for a typical suburban sized front yard or a backyard, 10 to no more than 20 different species of well-selected plants is probably all you need. Don't put in 120 different things and then feel like you're behind or pressure to learn how to maintain all of those. Uh, you can even have fewer than that. And in fact, for pollinators and butterflies, having large swaths of a well-chosen plant that's going to provide them with what they need, in fact, sometimes is more effective than just having one of this, one of that, one of this, one of that, because they can safely move from plant to plant to plant to plant. Either approach can definitely work, but don't feel the pressure to put in 75 kinds of different plants. If that's going to be overwhelming for you, then it's better to keep it simple and maintainable and choose your plants and select them. And that's going to be awesome. Don't go overboard and put in one of each of 100 different species.
So here I put 12 to 15, uh, I just said 10 to 20, somewhere in there. And it doesn't need to look super wild if that doesn't appeal to you. So this is a, I need to recenter this photo. Uh, this is an off-centered photo that I took of a kind of conventionally designed yard, but using 90% California native plants. And it does take a lot of trimming and clipping to keep the yard like this, where all the ground covers hit the edge just perfect. And doing all of that kind of pruning and maintenance does reduce the habitat potential some. But if you compare this to the conventional yard that it replaced, so much more habitat value in this still relatively conventional looking yard. If you go kind of with more that, that more wild naturalistic look, that will definitely enhance the habitat value. But if that's just not going to do it for you, then you can achieve something like this working primarily with your local native plants. We're not going to talk a lot about that like visual designy design tips because that's kind of beyond the scope of what we can cover in this three hours. But for those of you in California, I'd encourage you to check out our California Native Garden Design Workshop on our YouTube channel. And then combine that with what you're learning today. So research flowers year round if possible in your climate, if that's not possible, as much of the year as possible. So for us in Southern California, that there's a ton of stuff blooming spring into summer, but one of the areas where we want to make sure we select for in our home gardens are making sure that we also have material that's going to bloom late summer, fall, and into winter. So this ha just happens to be a picture of a section of the garden at the LA Natural History Museum that had goldenrod, aster, and coyote brush, all of which are good late summer into fall flowering plants that are great for wildlife. Some notes on garden care. Don't deadhead your faded flowers too quickly. Let those seeds develop. When you do cut plants back, leave as much of the trimmings in the garden on the ground as new mulch as possible. And that says seeks, but it should say both seeds and twigs will be used. So we have in my yard, a lot of birds especially smaller ones uh, like goldfinches or sometimes bush tits that like to eat seeds off of the, the edges of shrubs and wildflowers. But then after those dried, dead kind of flower heads are cut, when we lay them onto the ground as mulch, then we have a whole other succession of birds like California towhees and morning doves that like to eat the remaining seeds off of the mulch. So if we just put those in the green bin, we'd be losing all of that. And then additionally, depending on the texture, how much of the material you have, using some of that to be your next organic mulch layer in your garden is going to be just as good, if not better, than the wood chip mulch that maybe you would have to bring in over time. And so for my pathways to keep it kind of walkable, uh, we bring in wood chip mulch and refresh those. But most of the other planter areas, as soon as we're into the habit of where we are doing some annual pruning as much as possible, that mulch layer is the trimmings of, of different plants with the seed heads, some of the stalks or stems and the different textures of that material also provide lot, a lot more little uh, kind of niches for some of the native pollinators as well, where just the shredded or ground up mulch uh, doesn't as, as much. Uh, so don't be too neat. So this is you know less than conventionally attractive. These are some dried out clarkias at the base of a young Western redbud, large shrub, small tree. But the dried out clarkias, after the pink and red flowers bloom or fade, are bird feeders. We have tons and tons of goldfinches that will come every day for months and months to eat every little seed out of those dried clarkias. So you can see this is that same western redbud. This are, these are those same clarkias. And they are hilarious as well, very entertaining to watch. They'll climb to the very edge of each little stem and the stems will bend under their weight to fastidiously pick out each and every seed over months. And so this is, we have one small space that's dedicated 
primarily to wildflowers and so much bird activity happens in here. Now again, be wildfire safe. So if I was living five miles away in that urban wildland interface, then I wouldn't leave this up. I would mow this down with a string trimmer and depending on how close it was to the house, maybe leave it as mulch, maybe I need to get rid of it. Uh, so do what's gonna be safe for you. But just in terms of maximizing the wildlife benefit, uh, you know, this is this is great. And it does have its own kind of wild, ruggy, rugged beauty to it that might not look like it belongs in a conventional garden right off the bat if this is the first time you're seeing it. But there are also subtleties of the forms of the different flowers the different browns and beiges and golds. And it really is quite lovely. And even when it's backlit kind of glows uh, in certain times of the day. So really like having it around. So leaving the seeds and the stems around is that mulch layer when cutting back the plants is really going to increase the wildlife value. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples of where to choose and learn about native plants. Now, these are obviously going to be California focused, but for those of you who are not in California, there are a number of other organizations that might have similar uh, resources where you are. So if you want to kind of look at these with us, you might get some tips on how to use some of those similar resources that might be relevant to you. So we'll do a quick demo. So this, is the Inland Valley Garden Planner website. This was developed by my agency specifically for gardeners in our local service area, but lots of the information is going to be applicable throughout California. And then a number of these plants will also grow well into like Arizona, Texas, Nevada. I would say you'll have to know which plants are going to grow well, but then you can check this to see if we have that detailed profile and information about that plant. Uh, so it, it's called the Inland Valley Garden Planner because we are in the Inland Valley, Inland Empire area. All of this information is going to be pretty much an exact match for anyone from like Riverside through the Inland Empire all the way out to the San Fernando Valley. And then yeah, most of these plants are going to work throughout most of like non-desert, non-mountain California. Uh, the watering information, just like in more coastal areas, you can probably get by with a little bit less watering. So if choosing plants is kind of daunting to you, you can go right to a garden style section where we've created some pre-made different plant lists of compatible plants. And so here you can see for this talk, we have butterfly and songbird garden and a pollinator garden. And they're not in the California native color garden and they're not exclusive. Like a lot of the butterfly plants are good for pollinators. A lot of the pollinator plants are going to be good for butterflies, but that, uh, that will kind of get you started around a focus or you can combine plants in these three throughout a lot of them. So we're talking about flowers year round. We kind of make sure we have that in the native color garden. And so if you select on any of these kind of visually see what some of the plants look like, there's a description. There's the plant list where we try to keep it pretty simple, but just a few trees, a few shrubs, a few perennial plants. Some of them have a grass or two. A little bit talking about the horticulture, the moisture needs once the plants are uh, established for our inland valley areas. And then each one of these plants then has its own profile where you can see pictures of kind of close up the flower, growth habit, a description of the plant, again, the water needs for the individual plant, and then those really important properties for figuring out the right plant, right place. How high is it gonna be? How wide is it gonna be? The soil adaptations, the exposure adaptations in terms of sunlight, and then other kind of functional information. And then for all of these plants, once you plant them, you're gonna to need to know how to maintain them. Now maintenance on the vast majority of these habitat type plants are very easy. Usually you don't need to touch the plants more than once, sometimes twice a year. However, what time of year, what kind of cutback you do, what kind of cleaning up you do is very important. So for example, in Southern California, a lot of our native plants might be cleaned up in the spring. A lot of them might be cleaned up in the fall. 
if you clean the one up at the wrong time of year, it might kind of sulk and not do much for the rest of the year because oftentimes they're cut back right before like their main growth spurt. And so if there's a lot of information in here, it doesn't mean it's complicated. Uh, sometimes this is just me writing about the things that I see people do that they don't need to do. Sometimes less is more. So really trying to set yourself up. Sometimes there's tips on a little bit of pinching back the first year will help it have a nice form long-term. Sometimes you don't need to do that. And so that is the garden styles. And we are working on a whole new section of this website that's going to be about how to take this inf plant information and turn it into a whole planting design with lots of example designs that can be emulated for different size yards. That will probably be actually launched live on the website in the early summer or very late spring. So sign up for our newsletter for those of you who are gonna be gardening in similar climates or similar areas, and you will definitely find out when that is launching. The main heart of this website though is the plant finder. And this is similar to a number of other areas where they'll have a good plant website with information. So for here, for example, we might say we want a, we know we want a perennial plant because we're working on maybe filling in some areas along a pathway. That's gonna be California native. It's gonna be low water, it's in full sun. And we know we want it to be good for butterflies. And so out of the 350 plants in this database, which are our top selections for home gardeners for this area, kind of combining what you might need to go to a specialty nursery, but what you know, is not super rare, what you're likely to be able to find at some time throughout the year and plants that are all pretty easy for home gardeners to grow. From there, we have seven top recommendations that meet these criteria. And then you can select on each of these plants and learn about them to select your top plants. And then there's also some additional lists of various other aspects like things that are good on slopes. If you just want to see all the butterfly plants, things that can make a good hedge or screen. And so with these, for example, someone was asking about containers, you can set up like a butterfly container uh, query in that uh, plant finder. And then that'll give you some good plants that meet meet those considerations. Another one that I want to show that's really great for California is Calscape. This has, this is a project of the California Native Plant Society. This has profiles of far more native plants than the Inland Valley Garden Planner. We intentionally chose, it's like the top 120 or so natives are in there. This has profiles of almost 8,000 plants. Uh, many of which are good for gardens, some of which are trickier to grow for gardens. And so one cool thing just to check around is, is you can enter your address and see plants that were expected to historically have been native to that area. But that's not only going to focus on plants that are good for gardens, and some of those plants might be very rare or almost never available in nurseries. And you can also just search for a plant by name. But for most gardeners, that are coming to these workshops, you're actually going to want to go to advanced search to get your simplest results. And so what you can do is you can say, for example, you want a perennial that's full sun, you have fast draining soil, all of that. But for most home gardeners kind of just getting into this, you're also going to want to put very easy for ease of care and commonly available for nursery availabilities. And that way you won't get something super fussy that really wants to grow as a wild plant that's hard to grow in a garden. Some native plants are like that, but many of them are very easy to grow in a garden. And then you'll get something that you're likely to find. And from there, and then if you're trying to give yourself flowers year round, you can also work with that flowering season. And from there, you can run your search and then you can go from there. And then for each of the plants, you also do get a lot of individual information that you can use for your right plant, right place selections. And so in addition to that, just one other great resource I want to mention for those of you in California is there is a YouTube channel called Landscape, Landscape Integrity Films and Education that has great native and habitat gardening content really beautifully shot. 
And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about some design inspiration. I wanted to provide for those of you just getting started for California gardens, some of my favorite simple plant combinations. Maybe you're just gonna be doing one planter bed. Maybe you're going to be doing two. Uh, if you're not starting with the whole yard. And so this is kind of an example of one of the example landscape designs, just a small part of that new feature on the Inland Valley Garden Planner that we're working on for a bird and butterfly garden. And we're gonna just look at some little vignettes from this that could be done in, in just one planter or small area as ways of getting started. So for example, if you just have one planter in mostly sun or part day sun and then part shade, here are four of my top favorite plants that can be, you could be successful with in a three to six foot deep planter, depending on how many of them you put in. And so we'll just kind of talk through them one by one and then go from there. So top plants to get started with habitat gardening for full sun in much of California. Margarita Bop Penstemon is a about a two, sometimes three foot wide, small perennial plant. It's evergreen, so you don't ever have to cut it back all the way to the ground. You just kind of clean it up once a year. Has these beautiful, almost iridescent purple to bluish flowers. And it's loved by hummingbirds and bees. It hosts butterflies and moths and is one of my very favorite for like path edges. It blooms for a very long season, spring into summer. And then to kind of balance that out, also a similar size is red buckwheat which is actually from the Channel Islands, but grows very well, even inland. I generally don't put an area with heavy, heavy reflected heat, like in Pomona, where it's well into over 100 degrees in the summer. Uh, I've tried them like along an asphalt driveway in full afternoon sun. Uh, some of them make it, some of them don't, but anywhere where it gets, you know, it's not that extreme. It's very happy in full sun and can take some part shade. And then... Uh, with that, you have a long flowering season that begins late spring or early summer that will carry you farther into the summer than the penstemon. Many pollinators and butterflies like it. The birds will eat the seed and the butterflies also will kind of use it as a host plant. And then other two plants, just simple kind of almost no brainers to try is Delamina verbena. This is a California native verbena plant that blooms throughout most of the warm season. It's probably our local top nectar plant for butterflies. I've had this in tiny one gallon pots with like just a couple of little flowers on it, hardly even a plant and butterflies are already coming around to, to check it out. They just love it. Also used by bees. And it can go semi-dormant in the peak of summer. Sometimes looks a little straggly, just a light cut back as soon as it kind of cools off on the far end of summer. Inland, it kind of gets going again. And, you know, with a little bit of heat in the late winter, it's in bloom a little bit in my garden already right now. And then final one for the top ones for full sun into part shade is going to be hummingbird sage. This is a little slowly spreading sage. So it's very different than our big bushy native sages. Flowers are loved by hummingbirds, also used by bees. It flowers in spring, early summer, and then often flowers again in the fall. So in that fall blooming is really a nice kind of fill in at the end of the season. And all of this is, you know, the, the Delamina verbena is the tallest one. It's going to be about knee high. All of these are pretty small, easy to put in along paths or just one sunny planter bed. If you have a north facing or shady planter area. So a lot of people say like, yeah, but what do I do on the north side of my house or the north side of my garage where it's shady throughout the whole winter, part of the spring and, and a good part of the fall. But then by the time it's summer, it's full blasting sun overhead. So here are some of my favorite plants for those exact kind of funny conditions. We have lots of great habitat plants for that. For shrubs, California coffee berry is great. And there is a dwarf cultivar, natural cultivar that just stays a little bit lower called Eve case that's available. That's kind of my go-to for like foundation plantings. Even if you want one great habitat plant that you can do a whole row of 
that'll stay below the windows on the north side of that the house, you can go with that. Many birds will eat the fruit and the seeds. It's not related to coffee, but the, the fruit starts green, then ripens to red, and then turns up this coffee color when it's fully ripe. We can't eat the berries. Uh, it won't kill you, but it will really kind of make you feel miserable, uh, upset stomach for a while. But they're really important for mid-sized birds like jays and mockingbirds. Absolutely love these. Also hosts butterflies for the larva. And it has a dense branching structure that provides good cover for birds. And it's, it's really beautiful, this kind of even green year round. It can take full sun inland all the way to full shade. And, uh, and just has a lovely form. Uh, you can grow it in a pot. It's just, and it, it works great as a single one or as a, as a hedge. And then the other shrub that I like, lots of the manzanitas, especially inland where, where uh, they can be kind of tricky in full sun, work well in that kind of Northern exposure. My go-to uh, kind of mid-size manzanita is sunset manzanita. And manzanitas are really important in the Southern California habitat garden. Uh, throughout most, much of California because many of them will bloom winter to early spring and there's not a whole lot blooming in the winter and the blooms themselves are adored by hummingbirds and butterflies and they're these tubular little bells so hummingbirds and butterflies can get in there but actually certain bee species if they are around because the weather is warm enough and they're not dormant this time of year will rob the flowers by chewing a little bit of the base of the flower and then directly going in to get the nectar without actually pollinating them. So it's a kind of trick that the bees have figured out. And so really critically timed source of nectar and the berries that are developed are then enjoyed by birds later on. And then for the ground cover layer, uh, that hummingbird sage can work pretty well as well. I prefer to grow it in a little bit more sun. In some gardens in too much shade, it'll get powdery mildew, but as long as there's good air circulation, uh, can be worth trying. My go-to for that northern exposure though is yarrow. Uh, such a good habitat plant and it's a good ground cover. It'll, it'll spread somewhat aggressively over time, but it will then as it fills in, there's less weeding to do. Uh, about once a year when I cut it back, I do pull some that's getting a little bit farther than I would like it to get. So there is some maintenance, but it's used by many pollinators and beneficial insects. It's adored by ladybugs and hoverflies. It's a important nectar source for adult butterflies. The birds eat the seed, host plant for many moth species, and it's absolutely beautiful. It's a little ferny leaf ground cover and can be surprisingly low water in the kind of northern exposure shady areas. In the full sun, uh, for example, like in my garden, in my front yard, I have a bunch of this in an area that would be a pathway, but I don't need to walk out there very often. So we have yarrow instead of just needing to maintain mulch. We'll water the whole garden uh, about once a month in the summer, but because it's really hot inland, about halfway in between every other week, I'll just get out there with a hose and kind of water just the yarrow to keep it looking uh, decent. It'll survive looking kind of wilty. It's very tough, but just to keep it looking better, a little bit extra hose water. Closer to the north side of the house, it, it seems just fine because it's a little bit shadier and cooler. And then really close to the north side, not getting a lot of overhead direct sun in the summer, kind of like under the eaves of the house mostly, and then it'll spread underneath shrubs, is California strawberry or woodland strawberry, is just this really nice green, pretty fast spreading ground cover gets nice white uh, flowers. And then it will actually develop little strawberries. The commercial strawberries that we eat are actually a hybrid of a European strawberry and this California native strawberry. And so the strawberries can be sweet, but they're tiny. You can eat them if you can get them, but the birds are gonna eat most of the fruit, which is habitat. They also host butterflies and caterpillars, or there's caterpillars that eat the leaves. And it's, it's just a really easy, really nice looking spreading ground cover to kind of fill in under and between other shrubs. And then whatever kind of area you're in, whether or not you're in California, one of the easiest ways to kind of jumpstart your yard for habitat value is to plant what I just call a habitat hedge. A lot of us have somewhere along the border of a property, whether it's in a front yard, where we don't wanna look at the neighbor's driveway as much, or it's in the backyard where there's just a wall or a 
fence that you don't necessarily want to see, uh, we could use a hedge. And so instead of just choosing one species and shearing it back to a blob all the time, you can choose two or three top habitat supporting shrubs and plant them a little close together than they would be as just a single growing plant. And then just do some uh, pruning, not necessarily with an electric hedge trimmer, but just getting out there with the hand pruners or a loppers uh, a couple of times a year. And you can have this powerhouse, powerhouse of habitat because that hedge will then provide that dense structural habitat as well as having those top plant species. So for Southern California, my top three for a habitat hedge would be a combination of holly leaf cherry. This is our native true cherry. It, uh, so it's a cousin of the commercial cherry that we eat. If it's fully ripe, we can eat it, but mostly it's a big seed that then has just a little layer of fruit that doesn't taste that good on the outside. It's not very juicy, but again, really important bird food. So many birds eat the fruit, uh, butterflies, butterfly host plant for the larva and for moths. And then the spring flowers are nectar for many butterflies and uh, bees, pollinators like it as well. And it's just a really nice evergreen looking plant. If you're only gonna go with two and you want it to be something that's kind of neater looking, I'd recommend going with holly leaf cherry and California coffee berry. Those are the two that I have for my habitat hedge in my front yard. California coffee berry, this is just the fuller, taller sized version of the Eve Case coffee berry I mentioned on the last one, exact same habitat benefits. And then a little bit wilder looking, but a super, super important habitat plant is coyote brush, uh, Baccarus. And that one is really important for habitat for a few reasons. It has late summer into fall blooms, which are small. You can kind of see the combination of blooms. It's almost like this fuzzy effect. They're small. They're not individual, necessarily beautiful flowers, but it's a beautiful look that does catch the light very strikingly when it's in bloom. The seeds are really important for birds and they come at that late summer into fall, sometimes even later. Host moth species. And then the structure is just great bird cover as well. And, uh, if you happen to live in an area where there are quail, quail absolutely love coyote brush. So it's a, it's a great specific plant for them. And so you get some diversity into your hedge and very easy to take care of. Great, great nesting. And you get a visual screen that you might need otherwise. And then the last example that I will show as just like a quick thing you can emulate to get started quickly is some people, they're taking out a good chunk of front lawn. They don't use that front lawn as a really kind of inhabited space. They want something very easy to have look good, very easy to maintain, and not a ton of different plants. And one of my favorite ways to go is with a dry bunch grass meadow with then colorful accents. And so deer grass, our California native, Mullenbergia. If for those of you in Texas, uh, it's a cousin of some of the mullies you have out there like pink molly. but here deer grass is our native one, has these very narrow flower stems that stayed like this just right on the plant because it's a very narrow flower. They don't kind of fall apart and it only needs to be cut back every two or three years to kind of refresh the growth on it, but it will keep these flower stems and just keep sending out new ones seasonally after that. So it looks striking, looks good year round, beautiful when it catches the morning or afternoon sunlight. It's decent sized. Uh, the, the width of the grass part itself will be about four feet. And then with the flowers laying all the way down, it'll be about six feet. Normally plant them four or five feet apart, a little bit farther if I'm gonna be putting other perennials in between. Goldfinches love the seeds of this and some other small songbirds. And so when they're ripe, they'll be all running around through, especially if you have a kind of a meadowy effect, they'll be kind of going from one to the other. It's really magical. Uh, skipper caterpillars, which are really cool, are great. Uh, they really like the, the leaves for their larval host plants. And then that kind of becomes this really attractive uh, matrix is kind of the landscape design word, really attractive kind of backbone where you can put other flowering plants. I really like showy penstemon. It's a, uh, because you can say a botanical cousin of the small penstemon that I showed before, but this one will send flower stalks up four or maybe even five feet tall. And then after it's 
all done and the seeds have developed, you cut it pretty hard back. And so when it's cut back, it's just kind of a green base that you don't even notice that much between the grasses. But then for a decent length season in the summer into fall, even I have a couple of flowers on some right now, uh, they're just very dramatic, very tall, loved by hummingbirds, loved by native bees, and some of the moths and butterflies use it as well, spring being the main bloom time. And then you can throw in a couple of shrubs. So some really easy choices would be any of the they're hybrids of Cleveland sage and purple sage, the wild plants. But uh, in the nursery, it would be Alan Chickering sage, Pozo blue or Whirly blue. They're all the same cross between the two uh, wild native plants. And so you can use them really interchangeably in the garden. They're, it's almost impossible to tell them apart on the identification. And they're just a pretty wide, uh, six to maybe seven in a favored condition foot wide shrub that smells amazing. Talking uh, three, maybe four feet tall, loved by hummingbirds and bees for the blooms, uh, spring to early summer bloom. And then after a cutback, uh, after those seeds have developed, you can often get a fall bloom as well. Already starting to bloom in my yard because we've had this warm winter. Uh, just coming into bloom in my yard right now. And in addition, they're loved by carpenter bees and bumblebees. And then finches and other seed eating birds will come and eat the seeds when the flowers fade. And then another kind of real color contrast and extremely important plant for caterpillars, for butterflies, is desert mallow. This is sometimes called apricot mallow. This is a uh, true California native desert plant, but grows really well in any warm area of California, used by many pollinators, has a long flowering season all throughout the warm months. Sometimes it'll stop for a little while and then start again, but usually if it's hot, it's flowering. Used by lots of different butterflies, the whole mallow family of plants. So there's mallows from lots of different area. They're really top butterfly plants for the, the larval food. And then the birds will eat the seeds. And so if you wanna download the PDF, here's just some examples of how you might use some of those top plants in a small front yard, a medium-sized front yard, a larger front yard, and then the extra large front yard. And that's the, uh, the project that we're working on about providing kind of more design inspiration. We're going to have many more different themes and then different views as well, some a little bit more uh, photorealistic of how you might apply those themes to different sizes of suburban yards. And you can do this in containers too. So if you don't have that big yard, that's totally fine. You can get started. It will take a bit more care and more frequent watering, even if you're working with the native plants, just because there's not a lot of root zone, but you can grow many of our top favorite habitat plants in containers. Some will take full sun, but if you're in inland Southern California where it gets really hot, Many even plants that are considered like full sun when you look up information about them really will appreciate being in an area where they'll get full sun in maybe the morning, but then some shade in the afternoon, especially during the summer and the hot time of year. That will keep them looking the best and blooming the longest if they can get somewhere where they have a little bit of afternoon shade. They're going to need water more often, Basically, uh, a good rule to go by is when the top one to two inches of soil are dry. So not just the very top. If you water it every time the very top of the soil is dry, that's going to be too much. But stick your finger down in there. And if the top one to two inches of soil are pretty dry, can be time to water. It's going to be very site specific, but usually I have a few native plants in pots in my backyard for a pretty large size pot. You can it's gonna be about once a week for like an established in the pot native plant, maybe more and really hot. And then pretty easy, just an easy way to go for water wise or native plants and pots is just use a, a cactus mix potting soil that you can get from the hardware store. Just has a little bit more perlite in it usually. And it, it's a, a very well draining mix, which is what our plants want. And so for those of you who had asked about container habitat plants, these are my very favorite and uh, good places to start. And then the amount of sun or shade are recommendations for inland Southern California. If you're in more coastal areas for some of the ones that I say, you know, need to be in part sun or shade to be happy in a pot, you can get away with more sun. 
And so this will be available on the PDF as well. I'm not going to read through each one. And then on that Inland Valley Garden Planner, we have detailed profiles of all of these. But again, remember, you're going to need to water a little bit more often. I just saw on the chat coming in that someone asked if this is available somewhere after. So for those of you who have come in, I will type in the recording will be available at cbwcd.org slash YouTube. And the presentation will be at cbwcd.org slash presentations. I'm gonna to need to do a little bit of editing of the downtime at the beginning and the end of the YouTube. So might be a, uh, a little bit of time, but by the end of Wednesday, that should all be up. And last thing on this section, and then we can answer some questions, is for those of you who are very local to us in our service area, so if you live in Chino, Chino Hills, if your water is provided by Cucamonga Valley Water District, Monta Vista Water District, Ontario, Fontana, or Upland, you actually qualify for our one-on-one -on -one residential landscape design assistance program where my team and I will work with you to provide a simple but detailed and, and to scale uh, plan for a front yard or a backyard for any kind of waterwise garden. We love doing habitat and native gardens. So this is an example of a front yard garden that we did for a local property as part of this program. There's a lot of details about it. Uh, it's no cost, but we do require a $100 refundable deposit that then if you put the Waterwise Garden in within a year and send us some pictures, you'll get that full refund back. And so if you're interested in that, you can get the full details on our website at cbwcd.org slash design assistance. That's cbwcd.org slash design assistance. And so let's cover one more slide and then we will answer some questions. So hopefully by now you are interested in doing wildlife gardening at home, but what about actually finding those plants, buying those plants, planting them, and then what happens next? Uh, so we have a ton more resources about all those other aspects of that, those parts of planning a garden project from installation and establishment to shopping and all of that on our YouTube page. We also periodically offer, we normally do two Saturday morning classes a month and we'll kind of go through a cycle, but I'm not gonna tell you wait until we teach that nine months from now. So we have all those recordings at our YouTube channel. And so for the planting part and for the, how to identify what's a healthy looking plant at the nursery that's gonna grow well, what should the roots look like, all that sort of stuff. And can check out our choosing, purchasing and planting waterwise and native plants online workshops for, especially for larger projects, but also, you know, anyone who's interested, you might check out our installation and establishment of California Native and Waterwise Gardens workshop. We have that maintenance information for each plant. And then also to help make sense of that maintenance information, you might want to check out our pruning and maintenance for home gardens and landscapes online workshop, where we'll cover proper pruning tools, how to care for those tools, keep them sharp, and then those basic pruning techniques for different kinds of plants. And then you can really make much more sense of that specific maintenance information. And for those of you in the Los Angeles or Inland Empire area, at that same website where the PDF is going to be, cbwcd.org slash presentations, we have a local landscape suppliers list and we will have the nurseries in there that I know of. It's all the nurseries that I know of. If you know of one that's not on there and it should be on the list, definitely get in touch with us and let us know. Uh, but it's all the nurseries that I know of to get the best selection and good quality water wise and native plants. And so for here, we're mostly talking about native plants and you can't just go to any nursery and expect to find a good selection. More and more are becoming available. You can even find a few natives at like Armstrong now, but mostly you're going to be more successful at specialist nurseries. And so each of the nurseries on that list, it will say what kind of plants they carry. So if it has a lot of natives, it'll say that on the list. And there's also uh, specialty places, for example, getting like mulches, gravels, landscape materials, irrigation, all that sort of stuff. So check that out. And for the nurseries, we also cover 
uh, into Los Angeles proper because sometimes people from my area are going out there. In fact, I'm driving to a nursery in Highland Park as soon as this is done to get a few plants for our demonstration garden. So what I am going to do now, it's 1133. I am going to answer questions. I'm also going to launch a very quick evaluation poll and then we're going to go forward. And the reason why I want to launch our kind of closing poll right now is because from here, we're going to spend our last half an hour going over common backyard birds, common butterflies, pollinators that you'll see in Southern California, and then starting to go through a top habitat plant list for Southern California, kind of plant at a time, like in those design examples. And we'll see how far we can get. And then you will be able to download the PDF to get through the rest of it. There's just too many cool plants to be able to fit it all into three hours. So I wanted to launch this poll now because for those of you who are not located in Southern California or California, uh, this stuff will not be directly applicable to you. If you're curious, uh, I encourage you to, to hang around, but I know that some of you might have other stuff to start doing on your Saturday. So wanted to kind of do this part of the wrap up that I need to uh, get your feedback from. In addition to the poll, as you're filling that out, uh, if you have other just feedback, I love to get feedback from people, whether or not it's positive. So if there's something that wasn't clear, definitely let me know. We're still, we've only been teaching these online workshops for a year want to make sure that the stuff is relevant to people and clear, or if there's anything that was particularly helpful as well, uh, please let us know in the chat and I'll, I'll make sure that we continue to uh, cover that in the same way. So while that is happening, let's answer some questions. Uh, so from admin, Hoping I can mention some native R's being misleading as being pollinator attractors. I totally get what you're saying. So I'll, I'll mention that briefly. It's a good point. So in the nursery industry, sometimes there are plants that are presented as native plants, but they're like hybrids or they've been grown really to select for like huge flowers and they're not kind of typical of, of how they would naturally occur anymore. Uh, there's been some research that has found that some of those are not actually as good for pollinators as like the wild, you know, the true species wild types. Uh, one example that uh, the person who typed in the question is talking about some of the new cultivars of echinacea or coneflower are not really accessible to the pollinators. So that's something you can look into. I will say for California, this has been looked into some, and I think a number of our, most of our cultivate, the most of our cultivars, there hasn't been that much advanced breeding in California, are just selections from wild species, which if you only grow that same cultivar and you plant, you know, 50 of them, there might be a little bit less diversity. But in California, most of our cultivars are still a, a pretty wild type. And in my experience, just watching them grow and maintaining them are quite good at supporting programs. Uh, so question from Claire about rainwater harvesting ideas. That's beyond what we can get to in this habitat gardening workshop. However, on our YouTube channel, we do have that whole rainwater harvesting for home landscapes workshop. So I encourage you to check that out. Uh, Richard, what about bats? Uh, Good question. So if you want to support bats, uh, having all of this so that you just have some diversity of insects, flying insects in your yard is that's what bats eat. Uh, occasionally I'll have a bat come through my yard. I don't live right near a lot of bat habitat. Uh, but for those of you who live on like wider properties or want to support bats and don't have necessarily great bat habitat, you can find plans online about how to build pretty simple wooden bat boxes that you put up on a pole then and where to site them that will then provide uh, that habitat for bats as well. Uh, so from Carla, 
What native plants would you recommend for honeybees? Which native plants provide pollen versus nectar? Okay, so honeybees, uh, just to make sure we're just all clear on it. Uh, so honeybees are European, they're not native bees. So mostly I focus on providing habitat for natives. And mostly that's because honeybees are generalists. Basically for, I can't claim every plant, but most plants they, that flower will provide either pollen or nectar for honeybees. And in most of California, the wild populations of honeybees are not uh, as nearly as much as a concern. And if, yeah, so I would say wild populations of honeybees are, are, are not as much as a concern. Uh, that colony collapse disorder is really more affecting concentrated commercial beekeeping operations, but habitat destruction of native bee pop populations, which are actually, act, actually much more effective and active pollinators in our home gardens are much more concerned. And native bee populations tend to be more specialized in their tastes. So you can look up lists for honeybees, but honeybees like all sorts of garden plants are going to be perfectly acceptable for them. Uh, someone asked for the YouTube channel again, please. So just type that into the chat. Uh, from Diane, plant types because of major gopher activity. Suppose trial and error is best or gopher baskets. Yeah, I mean, realistically, in my experience, I used to work in a, at a botanical garden that had a lot of gopher uh, activity. And what I find is that, you know, most of those, you know, like plant gopher plant and they'll go away. That doesn't work. Uh, there's certain plants, especially like euphorbias, which are not great, uh, habitat plants in most cases are like, they have a very caustic sap. And so the gophers will avoid those, but they'll just go for something else. I mean, I've read sometimes that like gophers don't love salvias or our native sage plants. You can do some research. There's one nursery, Diane, if, if you're thinking about California plants or even some Mediterranean plants, there's a nursery called Plant Material Nursery. It's based in Los Angeles that has, uh, they have like an online shopping cart, but even if you're not going to order from them, they have like different criteria you can you can select and uh, they do have a like plants that are more resistant to gophers. I think some of them, if you have major activity, it's not like you're going to plant it and they'll totally ignore it, but you might, you might take a look at plant materials, uh, gopher plants for gophers list. Uh, do I have a recommendation for simple landscape planning software or website? So unfortunately, Carl, uh, most of those softwares or websites, I don't think are that good. Like you end up with a pretty picture that's not really a very good or accurate planning tool, in my opinion. Uh, the best thing for most homeowners is to work on graph paper and multiple layers of tracing paper. And what you come up with might not be a work of art, but it doesn't need to be, but it will be a good and functional plan. And so for that, uh, for some kind of basic ideas of things you might consider if you're going through that kind of process of drawing out a formal design, you might check out our do-it-yourself landscape design online workshop. And in there, I do mention a couple of other sources. We are currently working on a project that's really going to be aimed at walking homeowners through that whole process step-by-step -step of measuring your site, drawing it out on graph paper, doing all of the layers to come up with the design, and then using some of our design examples uh, to actually kind of like translate things from those to your site. But that's something that we're in the middle of working on right now, uh, planning on launching that when we do our, our website update for the Inland Valley Garden Planner in the summer. So sign up for our newsletter at cbwcd.org slash newsletter, and then you'll find out all about that. But you might start with the do-it-yourself landscape design uh, workshop. From Diane, I've been advised for many years to plant milkweeds for butterflies, is that a good idea? Uh, absolutely, for certain butterfly species, monarchs and a couple others will use milkweeds. Uh, absolutely, monarchs can only use milkweeds. Uh, generally, you're gonna wanna work with the milkweed that's native to your area. There are different ones. And then I'm gonna jump back into the workshop content in just 
a moment. Uh, and hopefully we'll get at least through the butterflies part. And then, uh, and then I, I talk a little bit more about milkweed there. So a lot more good questions, but if I keep answering questions right now, we're gonna go straight through and not cover any more content. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump back to getting through some more of the rest of this for our last kind of 15 minutes, and then I will stay and answer all of the questions that come in after that. So with that, let's jump into 20 common backyard birds in Southern California. These are gonna be some of the most common guys that and gals that will show up. And I'm just gonna quickly, uh, I'm not gonna read all of the information of this. Uh, if you wanna download that PDF, you can, but we'll just kind of take a look at uh, some of the more common birds. We got Northern Mockingbird, American Goldfinch, and close relative uh, with a quick, Glimpse, kind of hard to tell the difference apart. Lesser goldfinch. House finches are a little bit bigger than goldfinches, but they'll often actually travel together and feed together. Instead of competing, they, they kind of uh, congregate, which is cool to see. Seasonally in Southern California, we'll get hooded oriole that likes fruit and berries. Uh, they Some of them will like orange slices out in the yard, although... Uh, I've tried to leave them for them and, and they don't really seem to do that in my yard. Maybe there's just other stuff for them to get. White crowned sparrow is uh, winters here. There's I guess snowbirds. And then when it's, uh, when it's warmer up in the mountains, they'll go back up. They will be uh, hanging out in the bird bath like you saw with some of the other finches sometimes. California towhee is a common ground dweller in my yard pretty much year round. And hummingbirds, you have Anna's hummingbird, Allen's hummingbird are the main ones in my local area. Very territorial. If you're interested in hummingbirds, you might be interested in having a hummingbird feeder or two. Uh, we focus in my yard on providing nectar. However, to really provide that year round source, I used to be very suspicious. I used to think uh, white sugar diluted can't possibly provide the the uh, birds what they need and there must be other stuff or nutrients in the nectar and this is probably not healthy but i was able to ask an ornithologist at the la natural history museum about that and he basically said the nectar that they're getting from plants is is pretty much just sugar hummingbird feeders as long as they're kept clean and the sugar is made properly are just fine it's going to be just the same nutrients because the rest of the hummingbirds nutritional needs are made up primarily from insects. And so they're really just going to the nectar for the high, high energy that they need to keep going. And they need it constantly. They need to feed multiple times a day or they will metabolically crash and can die. So we have hummingbird feeders. I like this design, which is easy to order online, this narrower flat one, because it's the easiest to clean and you need to keep it clean on a very regular basis because that sugary water will mold or ferment and that's not good for them. And so if like some of the long tubular ones that you need to clean with a bottle brush are harder to clean well, these are really easy to clean. And know if you're the kind of person to keep a hummingbird feeder clean. And if you're not that kind of person, it's fine. Don't have a hummingbird feeder, plant some native plants that, that the hummingbirds like, and that's great too. I'm not the kind of person who is responsible enough to be scrubbing out the hummingbird feeder every couple of days in the summer, especially when it's hot, they need it pretty constantly but my partner Kira is. So for the most part, the hummingbird feeders are something that she takes care of and I take care of other things. Uh, bush tits are really cool. They travel in huge flocks. They're tiny, they chatter. They'll, you'll see like 50 of them fly into a shrub. They'll be eating all the aphids and little insects off and then they'll fly off. Oak titmouse, if you have oak trees are, are really cool little guys as well that eat nuts and insects. And then you will often sometimes find common ravens and American crows, uh, which are related, but different. The ravens are the larger ones. The easiest way to tell them apart is the shape of the tail feathers. Ravens, when they're flying, display a shield-shaped tail feather pattern, and crows have kind of this more fan-shaped. California or Western scrub jay are our most common blue colored birds. 
Uh, very noisy, kind of shrieky, but absolutely beautiful. Black Phoebes, those are our aerial acrobats that are around in my yard a, a lot of the year and uh, are just furious. And uh, they are one of the few non-hummingbird birds that not as agile as hummingbirds, but they can actually briefly hover. And so I've seen them hovering along this back rock wall in my yard, uh, eating insects out of spider webs. Really cool to see. House sparrow is very common. It's actually a European species that can live basically anywhere and live off of trash or seeds or insects. Uh, so they are very common in suburban backyards as well. They can invade uh, like nest boxes meant for other birds. And so like our bluebird house, which hopefully this year, now that we have bluebirds, they will nest in. Uh, last year it ended up being a sparrow nest. And if you're lucky, you might get an acorn woodpecker. Sometimes even in the suburbs where there's not a lot of standing dead trees, uh, we've had one lately. They will make granaries and telephone poles if there are oak trees around. Morning dove is really common. They are beautiful kind of uh, pigeon relatives. Eat seeds mostly from the ground, not very smart. They will lay their eggs in really bad places. Uh, but are very beautiful, spook very easily. And then the hawks, red shoulder hawk. And the hawks can be very hard to tell apart, just casually looking at them. My ID uh, differentiation on them is not that good, still learning, red-tailed hawk and Cooper's hawks. And I don't know about all of the hawks, at least Cooper's hawk. Uh, but other than that, I don't think I've seen an oak titmouse in my backyard, but in two years after putting in the habitat garden, I've definitely seen all of the other birds uh, in the yard. So someone had asked about birdhouses. So this is an example of a well-designed birdhouse that you can buy online. There's lots of different brands. I didn't put this on to endorse the brand. It was just an easy picture. Uh, so this, for example, is a bluebird house, which a lot of people are interested in housing bluebirds. So it's a common one. And so the things to look at are, you want a properly sized hole for the bird. A roof overhang keeps things from getting moist and moldy inside if it rains. A vent is good to help with air circulation. You want something that's easy to open up and clean out very well in between the seasons. So here you can see the latch and then in between the seasons because there can be mites and other pests in there. You wanna clean it out. Uh, scrubbing it out with boiling water is a good thing that you can do between seasons and make sure to put it in a safe location. So far enough out on a branch where it's not gonna be really easy for a squirrel or especially a raccoon that might be able to reach in. You wanna kind of put it somewhere where uh, it will work. And then depending on your bird species, you can also read up, like sometimes it'll be best to have it on a branch and then have the birdhouse facing north, for example. So you can read up on all of that depending on the species of bird. We'll very quickly look through some common native bees that might show up. So all sorts of different, really cool, beautiful, once you slow down, gorgeous, gorgeous bees. Ultra green sweat bee, leaf cutter bees, which are really cool. They will actually, they love our Western red buds. You'll see these little semicircles cut out of them. That's evidence. So I've never seen Seen. I don't think the, the exact leaf cutter bee, maybe in my yard. Uh, they're hard to tell, so I wouldn't have the, the perfect ID on it, but I see those semicircles cut out of the Western redbud, so I know that they're there. Digger bees. So these are one of the solitary native bees that need some open soil, and they love tiny manzanita flowers. California carpenter bee. Very, very large bee, and then slightly smaller, but still a large bee. Bumblebee. You will see designs for bee hotels. If you're interested in doing something like this, you can. Usually you would do a variety of sizes. This one at the California Natural History Museum, I'm sure they had a specific bee in mind and they knew because they have experts there the size. In general, holes between an eighth and a half an inch of, in diameter, approximately five inches deep into something like a, a four by four piece of lumber with a little bit of an overhang will do it. However, you're not really going to get much more benefit from that versus something like this. So I just leave it at this in my yard. Lizards. I have tons of lizards in my yard. Uh, most common one is 
backyard lizard is going to be the western fence lizard in Southern California, which can be very variable in what it looks like, but also common would be Southern alligator lizard. The juveniles almost look like skinks, very long, small feet. And then you might find the common side blotched lizard. Lizards are hilarious to have around. They're very territorial and they, the males do push-ups to kind of show their territory. So I'll walk through and they'll be doing push-ups at me. They love living on the broken concrete. So someone just give us a small bird bath to elevate it some, we put it up on a cinder block and just use pieces of broken concrete from when I demolished part of a too large and busted up patio. And they love living amongst there and in rocks. And then this is the other day I was looking out the window where I'm sitting at now on this stock or this uh, branch that's in the ground for a bird perch and saw this guy staring back at me. Western fence lizards, the males especially have this bright blue spot on their neck, which is an easy way to identify them. And then common butterflies. Monarchs are a very common one, especially if you put in milkweed for their habitat and the monarch caterpillar. Narrow leaf milkweed. So our local milkweed, the easiest, there's a few to California. The easiest one to grow is narrow leaf milkweed. It's a powerhouse at supporting monarchs, but there's a reason why it's called milkweed. It does spread rapidly and it can be kind of raggedy looking in the fall. There's still this fall, late into the fall, we had tons and tons of either caterpillars or chrysalises on it or nearby. Uh, so I wouldn't put this in my front yard. My front yard's pretty wild, but this is a little you know, less than attractive, but it likes a little bit of extra moisture as, as well. So I put it in a zone kind of down near my fruit trees where instead of just mulch underneath, we have other native habitat plants that like some water like yarrow and milkweed, and it can kind of spread there and be a great little habitat patch for the monarchs. If you are growing any kind of milkweed, you, you will expect to have these little yellow aphids. Just accept that, don't worry about it. The milkweed is not gonna be less vigorous because of the aphids uh, and other birds or insects like ladybugs and especially young ladybugs love to eat aphids. So it's just part of that process. Uh, don't try to spray anything for the aphids. That's just gonna be part of it just to have those little yellow aphids on your milkweed. Other common butterflies include the pale swallowtail. And so I listed on some of these, if you want to refer to it, they're host plants. If you want to make sure you have the host plant in your garden. Not a native one, but very common because it likes citrus is the Western giant swallowtail. It's caterpillar looks like a bird poop. So if you see a huge bird poop, that's kind of moving around like, uh, like it's alive. It is, it's probably a Western giant swallowtail. Just saw a quick question coming out of the corner of my eye. Do butterfly caterpillar aphids attack gardens? I've never seen those yellow aphids show up on my vegetables and I grow a lot of vegetables. Uh, I think that species of aphids specializes on the milkweed. I've never seen it on any of my other plants and I've grown milkweed with other plants nearby a whole lot. You might also see the, if you're a vegetable gardener, you probably recognize this, the cabbage white. Uh, which is a caterpillar that birds will eat, uh, will go on a lot of our winter vegetables. Just one quick tip for vegetable gardeners, they love nasturtiums. So we always have some nasturtiums growing in our yard in the winter season, and we'll have way more caterpillars on those which grow so rapidly that it's not an issue at all. And they tend to leave a lot of our other vegetables alone. There were some California native brassicas. Most of them aren't common in our gardens, but you still might see these guys around. California sister, beautiful butterfly, loves coast live oak. Morning cloak is another, you might find it around. They like native willows, but in our suburbs, they're most often used Chinese elms. Buckeye, and then the skippers, which are hilarious. Skippers are those thick butterflies with double sets of wings, and they're super aggressive. They like grasses, but you will see them not only chasing other butterflies, but I've seen them chasing birds around. And, you know, they won't do anything. They're just territorial, but they, they will chase anything in the yard. And some of the blues.
And so since we're towards the very end, uh, I'm just going to kind of give you an intro and a couple of top notes about plants. Uh, there's so many great choices, it's hard to choose the favorites. So don't limit yourself to this list, but this is a great starting point for Southern California. This is a lot of my most tried and true. And so you'll want to download this PDF list. We're not really going to get through the whole thing, but kind of what this goes through is kind of similar to those design examples that I shared. And it's just those individual plants kind of in different categories and what specifically I like about them in a habitat garden. One quick note, if you have room for an oak tree, plant a coast live oak. Coast live oaks are gonna get big. So, you know, anticipate 35 to 40 feet over time, uh, but they are absolute powerhouses. I mean, I have so much more activity because we have an oak tree in our backyard than we would otherwise. It's where birds go back to. It's kind of our bird condominium this morning when it was still cold and I was taking pictures because the birds hadn't gone out into the garden yet. They would come out and then go back to the oak, but there was probably six different species of birds in there all at once. Lots of different butterfly and moth species also really rely on oaks. And so oak and willows in California are the two trees that are really the top, what are called ecological hub species. There's so many different either interactions between the oak and other species of animals, insects or birds, or there's other interactions that build upon those primary interactions that oak trees are really, really important. And in Southern California, there's a number of different oaks, but for the backyard, Coast Live Oak in most places is gonna be the combination of the easiest to grow and the quickest to start to grow in. So if you just have room for one, that's a good one to go with. And then the other thing, just to mention a little bit more about milkweed, because I threw some other pictures in here. So this is, I like to grow what I call an orchard meadow. So we have an established grapefruit, a young orange, and then other native habitat plants that thrive on that extra water, like yarrow, milkweed, and goldenrod. But you can see how much the milkweed, this used to be a pathway through here. And so we reestablish it every once in a while, but it'll grow anywhere or it can, you'll get chrysalises nearby, you'll see the whole thing. But for example, there's only one part in our demonstration garden where we would allow milkweed to grow because it can be so aggressive. And we didn't have much else going on there this year. We just did some replanting of other plants. And so it will take over this whole space. We had to cut back a lot. We put down some layers of cardboard as a temporary weed barrier, and we have to try to keep it contained. So it's going to want to grow if you put it in. There is another California native milkweed that's a little bit harder to grow in Southern California called showy milkweed and a few other ones that uh, won't grow in as fast. So it'll take longer. They're a little fussier, but they also won't spread as aggressively. And so with that, it's 12 o'clock now. So I'm just going to show you what is left in here and then we'll stop and answer questions. So if you want to download the PDF, there's some tips on top annual wildflowers and where to start with them. And those are great if you plant a young garden and you feel like for some of the shrubs that are large that are going to need some space to grow in, you can kind of temporarily fill those spaces with annual wildflowers as well, or maybe have one or two little spots in your yard to have them. But just make sure that you're leaving some space in uh, leaving some space for your plants to grow in. If you plant them too close to your young shrubs, for example, they'll grow so fast because the annuals do need to grow fast that they might shade out and kind of distort the young form of your other shrubs. And then it's gonna go through then in categories, for example, for patio trees, so smaller scale trees, my top choices and what specifically I like about them for wildlife and then from trees, It'll go to large trees, large shrubs, different categories. And then each of these have a full entry on the Inland Valley Garden Planner. So for here, the information is mostly focused on specifically the habitat information. And then you can find all the other information about size, soil, sunlight in the Inland Valley Garden Planner. And so thank you very much for joining us. What I'm gonna do is just put up our last slide that has all of the links to our programs. Oh, let's do this one really quickly. Here's the class to conclude in one slide. Plant a variety of native plants of different sizes that bloom throughout the year. Don't cut off seed heads too soon. And when you do, leave them in the garden. 
provide some source of water. Don't be too clean, leave some branches, sticks and leaves and stuff around. And then on the ground level, a mix of wood chip mulch, some gravel and stone is great, but remember to leave some bare soil. If you do all of that, you will be on your way to having an amazing garden that will support songbirds, butterflies, pollinators, and more. And so here are all the links to all of our other resources that might help you out. And with that, I will finish up and then go to the question and answer. So between the Q&A and the chat, if you have questions, definitely put them in the Q&A. There's been such a great active chat, but I think the questions might get lost in the chat if those come in. So I'm going to go back to the start of the Q&A and we will go from there. So a question, Diane Goldberg, uh, very early on ask, what do you do with the biosolids? Uh, I'm not sure which biosolids you are talking about. I can talk a little bit about compost and biosolids, but if you want to give uh, some more information back in the Q&A, I will make sure I answer that to the best of my ability. Brenda asked, are mulberry trees good for birds? Absolutely. Birds love mulberries. Uh, sometimes you need to fight the birds for your mulberries, but uh, so also depends on where you are. So for example, here in Southern California, like if I wanted a mulberry tree to try to eat some of the mulberries and knew that the birds are probably gonna eat a good amount of them, then that's fine. If I just wanted to put a plant in that's good for birds, I'd choose a plant that's more locally adapted, requires less water, that's also good for birds, like either a native elderberry or a toyon, just because it's gonna take a lot less care and a lot less water and mulberries get huge, so less pruning as well. Just saw in the chat, uh, where, can, where can you find this presentation? So the recording of this presentation will be posted midweek to our YouTube channel. If you go, you can see on the screen now, cbwcd.org slash YouTube will be where you can watch it. That'll take you directly to the playlist of all our past recordings. And then the PDF, if you wanna download it, I'll type into the chat right now, cbwcd.org slash presentations. Uh, cbwcd.org slash presentations. That's going to be the, the listing of the PDFs created of all the slides of our past workshops. And so this one will be like, it'll be up by, by Wednesday uh, at the end of the day. And you'll be able to download the PDF of this whole presentation. Uh, give it a minute. It'll probably be about a hundred megabyte file. Uh, and then also on there, for those of you in Southern California and are interested in nurseries, you can download our local landscape supply suppliers list uh, on that page as well. Okay, moving on. Let's see if Grace is still here. Okay, Grace is no longer here. Let's see if Liz is here for this question. Liz has left already. Okay. Let's see, Katie. Some of these. Okay, Katie is still here. Katie just moved to the Los Padres National Forest, and her backyard is literally the forest. That sounds pretty nice. Where can I find a place to tell me what I can plant here so I don't introduce something that is invasive? So, Calscape is going to be perfect for you. So you are in a place where, because you're right at the National Forest, you probably want to focus on local native plants because you also don't necessarily want to grow like a native plant from a different part of California that might then naturalize into the forest. So if you go to calscape.org and you go to the advanced search, you can not only type in where you are, and so it will give you a uh, it will return plants if you type in where you are that we're expected to at some point in time be native to your local area. But you can also then put in plants that, so if you just put in where you are, it'll put all the plants. But if you put in where you are, as well as plants that are easy to grow and plants that are commonly available in the nursery and all the different search criteria, then you will get a really good base list of plants for your area. And then remember as well, uh, since you're right up against the forest, that you probably also want to look up other firescaping information and uh, keep some extra space between your plants, maintain them, uh, and then closer to the house, 
you're going to want to work with native plants that in the summer can take a little bit more irrigation so you can keep some moisture in the plants and uh, be as fire safe as possible. Okay, moving on. So Virginia asked, does it matter what kind of yarrow? I have a strawberry yarrow plant because I like the flowers. Uh, so it's a good question. So the native species of yarrow to us is called common yarrow. The, the science on it is Achillea millifolium. There are some yarrows that are a little bit different, uh, that are different species. A lot of them are European. Our native yarrow, that species also grows in Europe. So to be safest in terms of the maximum habitat benefit, uh, you might default to our common just species yarrow selected out of the wild, which is usually gonna be white. And there is just a wild yarrow selected out of California uh, that is pink as well. Oh, I'm forgetting on the name, it's uh, Island Pink. It comes from the channel Islands. So it's Island Pink Yarrow. I would say chances are the other colors of yarrow will have similar habitat benefit because I don't think they're not hybrids. They are the species. It's just a selected range, but I don't think to my knowledge, I don't know if anyone's really done a study on that. So, you know, it's definitely going to definitely going to be a good habitat plant, uh, but that versus just the common white one, I, I don't have any good answer for you on that. But the, the main one is the common yarrow, Achillea millifolium, and then it comes in a variety of different colors if you are really looking at the different cultivars in the nursery. From Gail, will these hedge plants grow at higher elevation, 6,000 feet? That's pretty high up there. Uh, you are going to want to probably rely on, uh, well, I would, check, I would check Calscape with your zip code. That would be a good place to start. Uh, and see if they're on that list. And then also maybe try to reach out if there's a local California Native Plant Society to your area. So you can probably start by going to cnps.org, which is the main website for the California Native Plant Society. And if there's a California Native Plant Society for your area, try to get hooked up with them. And chances are there's gonna be someone who will know like the really specific answer to your question. Uh, some of them might, but some of them might get too cold up there. From Penny, is it, let's see if Penny is still here because that's a pretty specific question. Uh, yes, Penny is still with us. Okay, is it better to water from the bottom, like run irrigation underground to water the root? That is a huge question. Uh, probably not. On balance, it's often been said, and, and I kind of agree with it, it's often been said that California native plants, especially assuming you're in California, California native plants do better with overhead irrigation because it more imitates the rain. It washes down the foliage and allows then the, the established foliage of the plant to gently guide the water down and away from concentrating right at the base of the plant where the plants, especially in the summer, could be a little bit prone to rotting if there's too much water right at the the base where the root crown is. Used appropriately, I believe that a good drip irrigation system and most irrigation drip irrigation systems that go in, I will say, are not what I would consider to be a good drip irrigation system. Good drip irrigation system used only like once a month for most natives can be okay in the summer. But that's very different than how most people put in drip, which is just one or two little uh, emitters that go right at the base of the plant. That's bad long term. What I would really recommend if you want to get into irrigation, we have a workshop entirely about this, is check out on our YouTube page, our workshop that's retrofitting turf irrigation systems for water-wise and native gardens. It's exactly what you would want if you, are, if you have like an old lawn irrigation system and it's about converting that to either a high efficiency spray system that will get water higher above the plants, uh, and do that or to convert it to a proper drip system to try to water native plants. And even if you're setting it up from scratch, that will really get into kind of the, the examples of what I consider to be appropriate designs of irrigation systems for a California native or water wise garden. From Diane, curious about soil pH. Are these plants sensitive to pH? 
Most of them are not that sensitive. If you have extreme acidity or extreme alkalinity, you're gonna to wanna to do a little bit of research to make sure that things are adapted to it. In Southern California, most of our soils are neutral-ish to a bit on the alkaline side and they do just fine. If it was slightly acidic, sometimes in more clay, uh, most of these are probably gonna do fine on that slight side. That's generally considered a little bit better garden soil. Uh, but if you're on the extremes, you will want to uh, look that up. Uh, from Luisa, there are a couple of great horned owls that come to my trees at night. That's pretty cool. Is there anything I can do to provide habitat for them? They are a male and a female. Well, having a tree is good. Uh, they're hunters. So just having a, and they'll hunt uh, smaller birds or rodents. So just having a diverse habitat garden will provide habitat for some of the things that they're gonna need to hunt. And that and the structure is pretty good. Uh, make sure even if you have squirrels or gophers come up uh, or rodents, never use poisons because those can accumulate. Uh, from, let's see, is anonymous attendee still here? Uh, we don't have anonymous attendee here anymore. Okay, from Judy, is Judy here anymore? Judy, what is your opinion about using bird seed? Ah, good question. Uh, so I do not use bird seed, uh, but my parents in their garden do use bird seed. Uh, I, I like to focus on, I like to focus on providing the seed through letting those plants grow. Now you can, uh, like research specific birds and provide the seeds that they, they want, uh, like the main bird seed that my parents provide is, uh, nigella seed for goldfinches. And they have a much smaller yard than I do. I have plenty of wildflowers and especially our grasses, goldfinches love. So it's up to you. Uh, you know, with bird seed, it's mostly grown uh, overseas, I believe. It's imported. Uh, you also, it's something else to keep clean. Like right now, where, where all the chaff from the seeds, and I'm sure some seeds get through, uh, drop to the ground underneath the bird seed feeder. My mom is kind of, uh, in a struggle or competition with some sort of rat or rodent that, that has uh, in the last few weeks just keeps pooping there all the time. Uh, so she's trying to figure out what to do because it concentrates so much seed in one area. It's very attractive to rodents. Uh, so up to you. I would say if I, if I lived in a much smaller yard where I only had room for a couple of pots and still wanted, con wanted to contribute, I would mainly do that. Uh, but I also feel that if you start doing that, it's kind of a commitment because if a group of birds come to rely on that as a constant source of nutrition, uh, like in my yard, all my plants aren't going to disappear all at once. But if you stop filling up that bird feeder, uh, it will. So I would say, uh, you know, if you are going to do it, uh, stick with it. Uh, okay. Moving on. See if Jerry is still here. It's very specific. Jerry's gone. Okay, from Trisha, it was, I'm sure it was about the hummingbird. What type of sugar? Uh, plain white sugar. I like to use uh, organic sugar, or my partner who's the one who takes care of the hummingbirds. We use organic sugar. We just want to make sure that there's no pesticide residue. And then I don't remember the ratio right off the top of my head, but look it up. It needs to be the exact right ratio. Uh, and there's a specific way to do it where you bring it uh, because the ratio of sugar to water needs to basically match uh, what nectar would be for it to be healthy for them. And you basically just bring it to a boil and it boils for uh, just a little bit, something like two minutes to make sure that you're sterilizing it and then you let it cool. So uh, it's really easy to find that information on the internet, but if you're going to do it, make sure that you, you do that and you're consistent with preparing it in the right way. 
from BD, how do I deter 25 to 30 pigeons from landing on my roof? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you know, you see in urban areas, they have those spikes all over the place. Uh, I don't know. I mean, they sell these like fake, uh, you know, owls or hawks that you can put up in places like that, that are supposed to just like instinctively uh, scare them. But most of the time, I don't know for pigeons, pigeons are not that smart. Most of the time with other things, like it'll work for like a week and they'll just come back. Uh, from, let's see if Deborah is still with us. Deborah. So Deborah has read in some Facebook groups from very, some very passionate commentary about planting and not planting certain milkweeds here in Southern California. So as not to screw up the butterfly migration. I've been scared to plant the wrong kind of milkweed. Just wanted our thoughts on that. Well, okay. So I will say I am not an expert on this. Uh, but my partner has looked into this quite a bit as well. She's also a professional horticulturist who works with native plants. And I am under the impression from her that there are two kind of groups of monarchs in Southern California. Uh, one group that actually stays locally and one group that goes on that long migration. I will also say that uh, more and more, even like our common narrow leaf milkweed doesn't on some years it's so warm in the winter, go fully dormant, which is a concern. So no matter what kind of milkweed you have, one of the concerns with the non-native, the tropical milkweeds that stay more evergreen and growing year round is the seasonality. But more than that, it is that there are uh, also some pathogens, I think it's a bacteria that can build up. And normally with our native milkweeds, they will die all the way to the ground and fresh growth the next year. And so those pathogens, uh, their growth cycle gets interrupted. And those pathogens are ones that can then provide problems for the caterpillars and uh, when they go into their chrysalis. So we wanna make sure that things are getting cleaned out. So whatever kind of milkweed you have, the important thing is if it doesn't go into a winter dormancy or after it does, you wanna cut it to the ground. And I, will completely get rid of it, like green waste it, get it out of my yard, get rid of that parasite. And so whether it's the native ones I grow in the winter, they get cut to the ground, all that goes away. If you are growing the tropical one, some people will, the important thing is in the winter, cut it to the ground, kind of force its dormancy and throw it away. Beyond that, on balance, uh, I will be safe by growing the native ones and not the tropical one that you can get by Home Depot. But I personally am not going to make such a hard line that if you're doing the cutback, that uh, that people should never plant the tropical milkweeds. I would rather have people who are otherwise not going to plant milkweed if they can't get them at Home Depot, get them and just cut them back once a year. But the native ones, I would I would uh, plant if that's an option. That's what I encourage people to do. Uh, okay, let's see, from, from Waterwise, do I have a suggestion for a vine for a block wall that faces south in Claremont? It's a very hot space in the summer month, preferably evergreen. Uh, so there is only one that I know of that will really do it if you want it to stick to the block wall and that's not a habitat plant. That's just something that will make that block wall green and you'll shear it back once or twice a year. And that's the non-native creeping fig, which I have used because I've just needed to cover an ugly block wall. I've used that in my parents' backyard. If you're looking for an evergreen habitat plant I'm at for a block wall to cover it, I'm actually gonna recommend a non-native one just because there aren't that many horticultural native vines uh, that are evergreen. It's just kind of one of the gaps in, in the native uh, vines that we have. And so in that situation, what I would do is I would build some sort of trellis and with block walls, you can usually uh, get bolts that are meant for block walls, put them in uh, periodically and then run wire down it and it'll be very stable. And I would recommend you looking into blood red trumpet vine or distictus. It's a medium water use plant, but it's, it's really tough after it gets established. Uh, it grows rapidly. It can be like a 40 foot vine. It can cover the whole block wall with probably, you know, just one or two of them. 
uh, depending on the size. It's a beautiful evergreen and has in the warm season, lots and lots of red tubular flowers that are, are great for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds do love them. So it is definitely a habitat plant. Uh, and so that would be, if you're looking for an evergreen, that would be my go-to just with any rat kind of really rampantly growing vine that's going to cover a whole wall. Also remember that they'll also generally kind of reach out and start growing on shrubs or trees nearby. So vines, vines are just some work to kind of keep pruned periodically. Uh, but the, that blood red trumpet vine uh, would probably be a, a good choice and you'll get lots of color, lots of hummingbirds. Uh, Oh, okay, from Diane. I talked about uh, reusing water. What does your community do with the remaining sewage called biosolids? Yes, so all the biosolids from the recycled water in our community are brought to a facility that is a, it is a kind of multi-jurisdiction facility that's mostly operated by the agency that does the water recycling, the Inland Empire Utility Agency. Those biosolids are, mixed with uh, also some of the biosolids from Los Angeles County are then mixed uh, with wood chips and turned into a compost. I've actually gone on a tour of the factory. It's kind of crazy. They, they purchased literally an old Ikea warehouse uh, in Rancho Cucamonga. And so it's indoor for air quality control. And it's like going inside of a mine. They have this huge equipment uh, and they are very carefully monitoring uh, temperature, moisture levels. There's all sorts of sensors and they produce a uh, actually pretty high quality compost product. I know a lot of people don't wanna use biosolid compost. I was suspicious for a while on my edibles and uh, looked at some uh, lab reports and also just saw the success that other people who were using it were having. And so I, I do actually use it these days. Uh, my thought about it is, uh, you know, it's what we're creating as a community and so we kind of need to find the best way to uh, use it because we can't dump it into the ocean or just have it be a problem for someone else's community. And it, it's done really well in the parts of my garden that want uh, higher fertility. And uh, yeah, so that's how, it, that's how it's used locally. Also to meet air quality standards, the air being pumped out of that facility runs through the largest uh, biofilter in North America at the time it was built, which is essentially with fans forcing that water through, I think it's like about the size of a football field and a number of feet deep. I think it's at least five feet, feet deep of wood chip mulch and the actual microorganisms just naturally living on that wood chip mulch are able to sequester uh, lots of what would be kind of the, the smells uh, that would be not great for air quality coming through that. And, uh, then just every number of years, they just replace that mulch. So it's kind of a cool process uh, at that facility. Uh, so from Mike, should I avoid planting under a eucalyptus tree line due to oil drip? So the, the allelopathy in eucalyptus, which is what kind of gives eucalyptus the reputation for plants not being able to grow underneath, primarily actually impacts seed germination. And so I wouldn't try to grow plants from seed underneath the eucalyptus, uh, but you should generally be okay with planting uh, shrubs underneath the eucalyptus. Okay, let's see from Joanna. Joanna, I work for LAUSD and I have a list of approved plants from the district. My school is allowing me to pick, plant, pick plants for my school. That's cool. How can I get assistance to go through the list to see which plants would provide habitat? Uh, I would recommend you reach out to your local chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I would bet that somebody from the California Native Plant Society would be super happy to volunteer to help you with that. And for habitat also, uh, you might also reach out to the, uh, your local chapter of the Audubon Society. And there'll be probably someone who's uh, also passionate about birds. Oftentimes those same people know about other habitat plantings and can probably help you out with that as well. If you type back into the Q&A uh, what city your school is in, then uh, 
or what part of LA your school is in. Sorry, not what city, what part of LA your school is in. I might be able to help you know. Chances are uh, most of LAUSD area would be covered by the, it's called the Santa Monica Mountains chapter of the California Native Plant Society, but they are also very active in the San Fernando Valley. It's just called the Santa Monica Mountains chapter for the closest like wide natural area. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I would be very surprised if you couldn't get some enthusiastic volunteers uh, through those organizations. Uh, from Diane, what was the vine you just mentioned to cover a wall? Uh, the one with for the hummingbirds with the tubular flowers that I mentioned was blood red trumpet vine. From Diane, don't you have a na native grapevines? We do. Uh, the person was asking about evergreen. So our native grapevines are, are not evergreen. Uh, they're great. There's a couple of native grapes. Uh, there's one that's a desert grape, another one that's a, uh, a more widespread in kind of the chaparral and other communities native grape. Uh, and then there's a really popular, the one I have at home is a popular naturally occurring hybrid between the native grape and the wine grape. It was thought to be native for a long time, and then somebody did some genetic work on it. Uh, and that one's the Rogers Red cultivar, which turns acts a lot like a native grape, but turns bright red in the foliage before it loses it in the fall. Oh, Diane, interesting. In Florida, they have uncontrolled use of the biosolid fertilizer on ranches and runoff into the waterways has been terrible. Uh, yeah, you always, always want to be careful not to over fertilize. Uh, that, that is a really good point. Uh, yeah, like in my yard, I'm not concerned with that because one, I'm probably using less and two, uh, I've been sure to set my yard up so that I capture all of my water and nothing runs off. Okay, Joanna in Wilmington. I don't actually know exactly where Wilmington is, but uh, I would be happy to, when I'm done with the last few questions, there's only a few more, uh, I will look that up on a map and try to give you a suggestion. From Carla, would native plants grow okay under new banana trees? Uh, so banana trees like a lot of water, so there are going to be some native plants that are going to be fine with it, but it, it might be more kind of like wetland or riparian plants. Uh, a couple of ones that come quick to mind that can take that water would be uh, yarrow will be absolutely fine on the high water the, the banana trees get. Uh, that native verbena, uh, Delamina verbena, might be fine with the banana trees, at least for a few years. And then that narrow leaf milkweed uh, for the butterflies, if you don't mind it kind of growing all over the place underneath there, but it'll bring in a ton of butterflies. Uh, that would be, uh, that would be probably pretty, plenty happy as well. But if you want to keep it simple, plant a couple of yarrow plants underneath and they will spread out and should be good. Okay, near the south, in the south near the port of LA. Uh, I think that that would probably still be the Santa Monica Mountain chapter of the California Native Plant Society. They have a website and I'm sure they will have contact information. So yeah, look up the Santa Monica Mountains chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And then uh, you might just start with looking at uh, like Los Angeles Audubon Society. Uh, I think I think all of LA is uh, is covered by the same chapter, but if not, you can probably find the information from there. And good luck with that project. Sounds great. It's great that they are open to uh, input. Okay. Well. That looks like we've gotten through all the questions. Thanks so much for everyone. We still have 40 people here for all the Q&A, uh, half an hour in. So thank you so much for uh, the great class, all the questions, the active chat. I hope everybody got some information that uh, they find useful and have a good rest of your weekend. Sign up for our newsletter and please join us for future programs. And with that, I will hang out for just a couple more minutes as people start to leave in case I need to answer any more questions. Uh, but other than that, hope to 
see you and chat with you and answer questions in a future workshop. And one day when we can open up as well, run into you in our public garden.